Welcome to the Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 regular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. This meeting is being held in accordance with the Brown Act as currently in effect under the State Emergency Services Act, the Governor's Emergency Declaration related to COVID-19, and the Governor's Executive Order N-29-20 issued on March 17th, 2020, that allows attendance by members of the City Council, City staff, and the public to participate and conduct the meeting by video conference. Video conference locations are not open to the public. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I wanted to welcome everybody and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. Thus, if you desire to speak to the item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council considers that particular item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda entitled Public Communications, which is for public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communications should relate to an item that is on, that is not, excuse me, any comments during public common communication should not relate to an item that is on the agenda that evening. When I open the public comment period, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, which will alert the staff that you have a public comment you would like to provide. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name, city of residence, for the record. The council is conducting these meetings via video conference and given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make the comments. The Zoom feature for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. To provide a live remote public comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. This meeting's ID and password are 983-8475 one five one zero again nine eight three eight four seven five one five one zero the password is one six six three eight five repeated one six six three eight five if you choose not to provide comments but would like to view the meeting you may do so at one of the following ways youtube live um, by visiting the city of walnut creek's youtube channel cable broadcast, uh, Comcast 28 for incorporated Walnut Creek only, Rossmore channel 26, Wave channel 29, and AT&T Uverse channel 99. And another alternative is to live stream, uh, live stream it online at the city's website. At this moment, I would ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Francois? Here. Councilmember Silva? Here. Councilmember Waddell? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wilk? Here. Mayor Haskew? I'm here. Next on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does any member of the council wish to pull an item for discussion? Seeing none. Um, does any member of the public wish to comment on any item on the consent calendar? Please use the raise hand feature or star nine if you're by audio, if you would like to provide public comment. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral comments. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. 
Written comments submitted have and will be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read. At this time, I will ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Mayor, I don't see any hands raised for public comment. Thank you. Um, see... Okay, we're hot tonight, aren't we? Um, I will I... second that with the notation that there was an amended version of the license agreement with PG&E that needs to be approved. Okay, we have a fixed up second. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Waddell? Aye. Councilmember Silva? Aye. Member Francois. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Wilk. Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now we're up to public comment. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comments not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. Does any member of the public wish to provide public comments at this time? Please use the raised hand feature or press star nine on audio if you would like to provide public comment. You have two minutes to make your remarks and it would be cut off automatically at that time. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. We do have several individuals wanting to comment, so I'll go ahead and start bringing them in. Super. First, we have Steve Reiser. Thank you. Can you guys see me or hear me? All right, there we go. here we go. So good evening, um, I'm Steve Reiser. I'm a resident of downtown Walnut Creek and it's good to see you all. I'm here as a member of the Walnut Creek Homeless Task Force. Um, on behalf of the task force, I'm here to announce an upcoming virtual event called the Forum on Homelessness in Walnut Creek. It'll be the third in a series of informational forums on homelessness that's produced by the task force. Uh, the free forum is going to be held via Zoom on Tuesday, November 10th from 6.30 to 7.30 and will be moderated by our very own Donna Colombo. Um, it's designed to give community members and business owners an opportunity to learn about the actions being taken in Walnut Creek and Contra Costa County to address homelessness. We have a great lineup of expert speakers and panelists from the city, county, and Trinity Center who will discuss facts about homelessness, causes of homelessness, problems experienced by the homeless and the community, and possible paths and solutions to issues that result from homelessness in our neighborhoods. They'll also discuss the current challenges faced by the homeless and homeless service workers during this healthcare crisis we're going through. During Q&A, panelists will take questions from vir virtual attendees through a Q&A moderator who will monitor emailed questions. So the event's free and you can find out more information and register on our new website, which is a great website. You should all check it out if you haven't already. It's wchomelesstaskforce.org, wchomelesstaskforce.org. So we'd like to thank the entire city council for your service and especially for, for your support in our efforts in making a difference in the lives of the homeless community. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you. Thanks all. You're welcome. Stella K. Hi everyone. Hello. First, would you, pronounce, would you pronounce your last name for us, please? Yes, my name is Stella Kandanijakos. I've been a resident of Walnut Creek for a little over 20 years. I live in, um, oh, I'm not gonna say that publicly, but I am a <laughs> Walnut Creek resident. Um, and I wanna thank you guys for your time today and for your service. Um, I have been just impressed my entire 
um, time living here in Walnut Creek, how well our city um, is run. Um, I am coming here for public comment I think, for the first time ever because of an incident that I learned about uh, not too long ago on the news about um, armed guards at the Planned Parenthood site in Walnut Creek uh, attacking um, counter protesters. And the reason why I'm here tonight is I want to raise a concern that I have as a citizen for uh, to ensure that everybody has the right to peacefully demonstrate and the concern that anyone bringing armed guards to any type of protest um, adds a level of risk and concern that things aren't going to be peaceful anymore, as we've seen. Um, we have seen concerns about people having uh, access to their medical care um, for various protests, whether it's John, Mur John Muir emergency, whether it's Planned Parenthood. And I am here to ask the council to consider what measures we can uh, take as a city to number one, ensure that everybody has the right to peacefully protest, to discourage the hiring of armed guards um, at any medical facility and to ask us all to think about how our city would look and how our um, peacefulness of our city would. I think we got the point and thank you very much for your comments. Joe, Next. Joe Spina. Yes, my name is Joe Spina and I'm a resident of Walnut Creek. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek for close to four years. I'm concerned about the, did we begin? Yeah, you did. Can you speak a little louder, Joe? Yes, yes. Thank I'm you. concerned about the maintenance of Walnut Creek sidewalks and streets. For example, the sidewalks and gutters along the 1500 block section of South Main Street are filled with trash constantly and many of the gutters of Creekside Drive. During the entire time I've lived in Walnut Creek, this area has been highly polluted. Uh, the South Main Street section of sidewalk runs parallel to Quail Court Office Park and San Ramon Creek. And the polluted sections of sidewalk begin at Quail Court, uh, begin there um, and stretch all the way to Pancos Pizza. City workers must maintain this area as it is highly dangerous and polluted. For instance, the sidewalks are continuously covered in many places with car window glass from broken car windows, plastic and glass bottles and containers, paper and cardboard trash, discarded signage from past construction signs, and many pieces of metal, paper, and plastic. The gutters of Creekside Drive are filled with papers, plastic masks, and organic debris like leaves. This issue must be addressed as it casts a sore mark upon Walnut Creek. Many people use these sidewalks to walk, bicycle, run, jog, and stroll. And if I sound overly alarmed by this, it's because I walk this route almost daily and many times with my daughter. Also, the trashed area is also directly across from the Welcome to Walnut Creek sign that stands on the island in the middle of North Main Street or South Main Street. I call upon the mayor, city council members, and works departments to look into this issue. This section must be kept in clean standing on a scheduled basis. Residents of South Main Street area deserve clean streets and sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. Grant Anderson. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Brand Anderson. I'm currently a resident of Walnut Creek and a member of your planning commission. Previously, I served over a decade on the Lafayette City Council and the City Council's Public Safety Committee. I've been involved with public safety issues for 35 years in three different cities, trying to find ways to make policing more effective. A week ago, public safety in Walnut Creek suffered a serious setback. NBC reported, a demonstration outside the Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood took a violent turn when armed security guards hired by anti-abortion activists pepper sprayed counter protesters Tuesday. The actions were caught on camera. Protesters have been demonstrating out this, this facility for years, but things reached a whole new and dangerous level Tuesday morning. 
anti-abortion protesters brought with them four armed guards who appeared to block the sidewalk. You can't tell us not to walk on the sidewalk. You know that's against the law, said counter-protesters. The guards first pepper sprayed a photographer who came to document the demonstrations. Then the guard used it again on three abortion rights activists who insisted they had a right to use the sidewalk. But the guards not only pepper sprayed the counter-protesters, and one reached for his gun. I'm sure you've seen the video. Make no mistake about what is happening here. The FBI provides the following guidance. Domestic terrorism is the unlawful use or threatened use or force of force or violence by a group or individual to intimidate or coerce a government or the civilian population in furtherance of political or social objectives. That is clearly what is happening here. Terror cannot be permitted to stand and the people who assaulted citizens of Walnut Creek should be held accountable and without delay. Every day that goes by without consequences emboldens such behavior. And if Walnut Creek does not make clear that violence will not be tolerated here, you know it will escalate until someone is seriously hurt. I would like to know what Walnut Creek is doing today to demonstrate that assault is not tolerated in the city and that action is taken promptly to assure it does not happen again. Thank you, Brent. Next we have Moxie Marsh. Hello, can you hear me all right? I can. Nice to see you, Moxie. Nice to see you too. Um, you. So my name is Moxie. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek. Um, and on June 2nd of 2019, I sat in my bedroom studying for my math final. My afternoon was not interrupted by gunshots. I went down to my kitchen that night and ate dinner with my mom and my brother. That week, I walked onto the campus of Los Lomas High School blissfully unaware that an alumni had been murdered just days prior. I walked past my current history teacher's classroom not knowing that she had gotten the call that one of her previous students had been shot in the street. On February 15th of 2020, I sat in my bedroom. I didn't know that it should have been Miles Hall, Miles Hall's 24th birthday. On June 2nd of 2020, I sat in my bedroom and I posted a black square on Instagram, never having heard Miles Hall's name without knowing that police violence had already torn its way into the streets of my hometown. Since that evening, I have watched a city council be comfortably complicit, crying their white tears over black injustice. On June 30th of 2020, I heard Miles Hall's full story for the first time. Over a year after his death, I heard the story of a young black man who walked on the same elementary school campus as me, who wandered the same high school hallways that I had just months prior. I had never heard the story of a family who instead of mourning their child's death has had to retell the events of June 2nd, 2019 to a group that has ignored them for 506 days. On July 1st of 2020, I attended a rally and saw Miles' family speak. I met his neighbors and extended family, people who lived a few blocks away from me for my whole life, whose story I had never heard and whose story I will never have to experience myself. But it's a story we must all hear because how does having killer cops on our streets make us safer? How can we as morally correct citizens allow a family to sit at a dinner table with an empty seat for so long? Thank you. Thank you. Patty Mitchell. Hello, um, my name is Patty Mitchell. I'm a homeowner in Larky Park. My comments tonight are on two recent public communications. I would like to say that the statement issued when the city settled the civil rights lawsuit with the Hall family was skewed, laden with words that both stigmatized and criminalized Miles Hall, and by extension, others who are mentally ill. The settlement was a no-fault settlement, as I understand it, with the city not needing to accept any blame or responsibility. But was it necessary to demonize Miles and paint an inaccurate picture of him and what happened that day when you informed the public about the end of the lawsuit? As I understand it, the reason the Hall settled was to avoid having a long drawn out court battle and further be traumatized by the city's continued justifications and lack of transparency. 
Again, I failed to see how the city statement helped the community find a way forward together to prevent another instance where a family calls for help to get care and ends up with a loved one killed. The second comment about is about the Walnut Creek PD's post on Facebook claiming that those who bring them donuts for doing their jobs are not the loudest voices in the community, but are the clear majority. And further, when given feedback about this language being divisive and perhaps inaccurate, the PD's response was, well, why don't you unfollow our page? Or the equally snarky, thanks, we're good. How does this happen? <laughs> I, I've managed public communications and done community building for over 20 years professionally, and I've never seen something so unprofessional and clearly inflammatory from a public agency or an organization. In the past, I've expressed to the council that the city's communications and notifications are often not timely, accurate, or sufficiently informative. I've also expressed concerns about how some city staff appear to be dismissive of or put off by residents who bring them to their bring things to their attention. My expectation is that the council and the city manager will address these concerns in a way that hold people responsible for city communications. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Kate Bennett. Looks like it was disconnected. We'll go to Catherine Wally. Okay, am I muted? Nope, you're doing fine. Great, thank you. Good evening council members and to all those in attendance this evening. My name is Catherine Wally and I'm a resident of Walnut Creek. I would like the council to request that the council be fully transparent with the community and accountable in how the funds are being or will be budgeted towards a listening session or listening sessions, plural, implicit bias training and the 24 seven non police pilot response program. Additionally, I and then made aware that the council had not responded to post concerns regarding the city's stigmatizing and factually skewed public settlement statement and did this to the social media posts from the police department. These actions continue to stigmatize those with mental illness and do create a false narrative among those unfamiliar with the case that an armed police response is appropriate for mental health crisis response needs. This skewed narrative will make it more difficult to gain community and countywide support necessary to truly get this pilot program off the ground. The city and the WCPD have a huge platform and a great deal of power. So the narrative that they, they create will shape the wider community's perspective. I personally have been reaching out to individuals in other cities in our county so that they can ask the respective city councils to join the effort in creating Miles Hall pilot program. I am concerned that these public statements on the part of the city, as well as WC, the WCPD, will discourage some of these individuals from mobilizing in their own cities, as well as signaling to other neighboring city councils that Walnut Creek is not truly on board with the non-police response. At these, Walnut Creek city council at, uh, at these Walnut Creek City Council meetings, we've been repeatedly informed that this needs to be a countywide partnership. I urge the council to reflect on how the recent public statements of the city and the police department, as well as the lack of response to the council of the council to post ask for concerns, erect real barriers in our effort to bring other city councils and community members from neighboring cities on board with the Miles Hall pilot program. Thank you again for your time and have a great evening. Thank you. Uh, we're going to try to bring in Pete Bennett back in. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Pete. Yeah, the settings here. Sorry, I have a broken phone because I can't pay my bills because I want to drive, drive this home so you understand. In December of 2019, 
I was about to file an amicus brief on the PG&E explosion and the bankruptcy. Instead, I found a man in the library, put me in a carotid hold, nearly killed me. And most of you don't give a shit. Sorry, Luella. It's true. A guy almost killed me in the library. Your officer just six months earlier called me mentally ill and I belonged in an institution. The same officer won a multi-million dollar reward, award with the town of Danville for civil rights violation in pro per. That's really hard to do. And then my attorney was killed over the summer. And I've been blogging about this, vehemently sharing with you. Oh, Mr. Bennett. Oh, Mr. Bennett, what are you talking about? Lord Cobbold. He's my great uncle. He reported directly to the queen. And go look up the word slavery, uh, modern slavery statement on your own website at Experian. The hell with you. You ran away from me. So I've lost everything. Oh, Mr. Bennett. Listen, we got evicted by a hearing commissioner. Official, you know who he is. It just cost you $4 million. Yeah, I know that guy. Go to oraclevspeoplesoft.com. Oracle v. Peoplesoft. I was part of the biggest hostile takeover in the world, but I was kicked out of Oracle world. I try to get work thanks to all the crap these your officers have done. Not all of them. A lot of them are good. Here we go again. Thanks for the bell. Michael Sampson. Good evening. Hello. Good to see you all. Um, my name is Michael Sampson. I'm a resident of downtown Walnut Creek, and I also happen to be a candidate for city council uh, for Walnut Creek this year. Uh, I want to speak directly to the public, if possible, uh, and just list off some ways that um, I think it's important that we understand um, that the members of our current city council are kind of not with the times and a little thick-headed. So... First, um, you know, in the in response to the June 1st protest, which erupted in police violence, there were many calls to make some reforms to how we do things, including um, banning tear gas, banning rubber bullets, never was even put on the table, never even considered, despite the fact that dozens of people raised their voices in support of these initiatives um, in testimony that lasted for hours. Um, you refused to use your power or leverage your power as a city council to fire bad apple cops like Curtis Borman, who, um, for anybody who doesn't know, has falsified over 30 police reports, which would have gotten any of us fired from any other job. Um, you refuse to support a resolution uh, to bar local law enforcement from collaborating with deportation police. This is something I learned recently. Such a simple thing to do, such a morally correct thing to do, and you wouldn't even agree to do that. Do that. Um, refused to even suggest at all that the use of police violent force on June 1st was unjustified at all, just completely sided with the police, again, ignoring hours of testimony from the community, uh, and refused to even consider defunding the police, um, instead increasing their budget by $1.3 million compared to last year, um, at the same time as you make major cuts in other departments and fire a lot of other people in other departments. So I just want the people who are watching this and the residents of Walnut Creek to know and understand um, that the current city council is, including Kevin Wilk, is very right wing um, and very passive when it comes to big issues. Um, so tonight you have an opportunity to speak out against Planned Parenthood. I would ask you to do so. And Thank you. Um, city Manager, there was uh, some questions raised about what happened at Planned Parenthood. Um, may we have an explanation, please? I believe Captain Hill is uh, signing on here, being let in. Was there any other public comment? Yeah, there, there is one, I'm sorry. Um, I thought it was done, but one more person signed up. Um, after this person, public comment is closed. Okay, we have Tan Hall. Mayor, if I may, before Tan starts, uh, another speaker 
uh, raise their hand just while you were making your comments. I'd recommend you take the two. I'd be happy to. It is now closed after Mara Flynn Rothman and Tom Hall. Good evening, Tom. Hello, hi, City Council. Um, I was just uh, kind of uh, not very happy with the comment from the social media on the police. I thought it was extremely divided. It's dividing like our community. Uh, it feels very us against them. And uh, while we've been coming here for 16 months, you know, the goals of us coming here is to, to make sure that things are done differently here in Walnut Creek and ensure safety for other family members. So somehow I think people are forgetting that, um, that something like this could have happened to your family on June 2nd, um, when my son was, was taken by the hands of police when he was in a mental health crisis. So when I, when I see responses um, from whoever is doing your social media, I mean, I hope they're getting, there's discipline. I hope they're getting um, written up for that because that is unacceptable. We have been coming here for 16 months. We've been asking you for changes within Walnut Creek. We've been coming here, pouring our hearts out, trying to, trying to get change for not just our family, but for other people. And when we see that this kind of stuff is happening around the nation, our country is so divided, it shouldn't be happening here in Walnut Creek. We should feel safe here. And I don't, I don't feel safe here. And I haven't felt, but I really didn't feel safe when the people who are coming to protect our family members are talking like that to people who are part of the community. So I just wanted to say that you know, Miles deserved to live. He deserved to be here. And so do the community members that are part of Walnut Creek. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Mara Flynn Rothman. I'm sorry, Melissa, we're not gonna take your comment. We have already closed public comment. Hi there. Um, thank you for taking my my call. Um, so I'm calling once again, uh, and I plan on calling at every meeting until something happens, because so far I haven't seen anything happen in response to um, the shooting of Miles Hall. Um, requests have been made of the city council, uh, and, I, and I haven't seen anything happen. I have not seen anything meaningful happen from our city council in response to what has been requested of the, our city council and our, in our police department even. Um, I would like us to have meaningful community input in the hiring of the Walnut Creek uh, new police chief. Uh, I would like to have request um, continue, I'd like to request continued movement towards the creation of a 24 seven non-police mental health response to the Miles Hall pilot program. And then I also request the city take accountability for the ineptitude in the response to Miles um, mental health crisis, rather than continuing to stigmatize the mentally ill and further criminalize Miles as shown in the recent settlement announcement. So, um, you know, we just, we need, we need a response. So far there's no action and we need a response. And I'm gonna to continue to, to speak um, every time there's a meeting uh, and until we get something done in our city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, city manager, after we address the first thing, I would like you um, to respond to the um, amount of work we're putting into to um, work on some of the requests of the um, Hall family and FOSAF. Thank you. So first, let's deal with Planned Parenthood. Hi, um, good evening, Madam Mayor, fellow council members for the record, I'm Jay Hill. I'm proud to serve as your interim police chief and I'm happy to address some of the issues that I've heard tonight related to the incident 
at Planned Parenthood that occurred last week. Um, before I do that, though, I, I do want to address what, uh, what Tom Hall just said, as well as what I've heard from some other community members regarding the Facebook post that, uh, that went out earlier this week. I do want to say that I completely understand uh, the, uh, the anger and disappointment from many members of our community related to that post. I agree. The tone of that post was absolutely not reflective of who we are as a police department, nor who we want to be. It was unprofessional. Uh, we are here to serve the entire community, regardless of how they may feel about us. So uh, I agree it was somewhat divisive, and uh, I hear you, and, and I have addressed it, and, and I'll leave it at that. Um, in regard to Planned Parenthood, uh, I've heard a lot of comment, not only tonight, but uh, throughout the entire last week, a lot of emails have come in. A lot of emails to the city council and to the mayor that have been forwarded to me, a lot of comments on Facebook, and a lot of questions have come up about our response and what we're doing and what actually took place out there at Planned Parenthood last Tuesday. So I want to answer a couple of questions there. First of all, there's been many questions related to security guards, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, why they're there, and that sort of thing. So uh, first of all, I want to make clear that the security guards that were out there were not employed by Walnut Creek PD. They are not employed by any law enforcement agency. They are private security guards, um, and they were hired by one of the protest groups that was out there that day. There's nothing illegal about that. Anybody who uh, has the ability and the money to hire private security you're allowed to do so. There's nothing against the law about it. There's nothing that we as a police department can do about it other than to discourage it. And we do discourage it. I don't think it's a great idea to hire armed private security at a protest. Just don't think it's a good idea. So we can discourage that and we are discouraging that for the future. Um, but as far as what occurred out there last Tuesday, we can't undo that, uh, but they did hire private security. In terms of are they allowed to carry guns, I've heard that question. Private security is, uh, some of them are authorized to carry weapons if they are licensed to do so. Not all security guards are licensed to carry uh, in an open carry capacity. And in order to do that, you have to be licensed and permitted to do that. The officers out there, the security officers that were out there that day, uh, to the best of our ability right now, we believe they were licensed. Um, one of, maybe one of their licenses had expired. We're looking into that right now. This investigation is still underway by our investigations bureau. We're looking into the licenses of all the security guards that were out there and whether or not they were actively permitted to be carrying guns. That's part of the investigation that is currently underway. I've heard questions about pepper spray and whether or not they're authorized to use pepper spray and under what circumstances. Pepper spray is authorized to be used by anybody uh, for self-defense. And on the day in question, the security guards claim to have used it in self-defense, that they felt threatened by the group of protesters that were approaching them, getting too close to them. And the use of pepper spray on that day was claimed to have been a use of self-defense. Again, this investigation is open. We're looking into videos. Uh, the officers that were out there that day interviewed everybody that was involved the security guards, the people that were pepper sprayed, at least those that would cooperate with us, not all of them did cooperate with us, but those that did, we talked to. And we are also in the process of gathering all of the video evidence that occurred that day. And our plan with that is to gather all that evidence and submit it to the district attorney and let them decide whether or not there's enough for criminal charges. So that's what's taking place with that uh, in terms of pepper spray and, and the investigation. I've heard some questions about arrests and why didn't the police department make arrests on that day? So when we were faced with that situation on that day, there was conflicting statements of what occurred by the opposing parties, which is typical. The guards claimed their safety was being threatened by the people who were pepper sprayed and the people that were pepper sprayed claimed that they were not being threatened. So the allegation of assault that the officers were investigating that day, the assault being the use of pepper spray, it amounts to a misdemeanor not committed in our presence. And when that's the case, we are limited in what we can do in terms of making arrests. Our typical course of action when we have a misdemeanor not, com 
not committed in our presence is to gather all the facts, collect the evidence and submit it to the district attorney and let them decide whether or not a criminal act took place and whether or not they're gonna file charges. And that is what's taking place in regard to, to this incident. In terms of what we can do to prevent this from happening again and what steps we have taken since last Tuesday, the protesters on both sides of the, of the fence are typically out there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This event last Tuesday, there was an event, I said Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm sorry, I meant Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, on the Friday following this event, we had officers out there to make sure that there was no flare-ups, that there was no escalation of events, and, and there were none. Um, it was a, a lightly attended event from a protest standpoint on both sides. And there were no incidents on Friday, but we did have officers out there to ensure that nothing flared up and things did not escalate. We did the same thing today. Today is the one week uh, since it happened. Uh, we went out there today. We had two officers standing by watching to make sure that nothing escalated. And I'm happy to report that there were no incidents today. In the near future, our plan is to continue to send officers out there and monitor the situation in hopes that tensions decrease and, and things do not escalate. But in the meantime, to ensure that uh, that is the case, we will be out there for the foreseeable future on the days that the protesters are typically there to make sure that both sides of the group uh, can protest and demonstrate their First Amendment rights peacefully and that people using the facility have the ability to do that safely. Uh, we have assigned a Lieutenant exclusively to handle this, um, to make sure that he is in contact with the the people from Planned Parenthood, as well as the, the different protest groups. So he has done that. He's spoken to Planned Parenthood officials. He's spoken to the 40 Days for Life group. And he's also talked to the security guard company. Um, we're also happy to report that the security guard uh, company has not been hired for any future events. Uh, it sounds at this point that they are listening to our advice that, that having armed security guards out there is not a great idea. And at this point, it doesn't sound like there's any more armed security guards planned to, to attend any of these events. But in the, in the event that that does occur, that we do have armed security guards out there again, we will send officers out there if they're not already on scene and make sure that they inspect everybody's licenses to ensure that they are in fact certified as security guards and if they're carrying firearms, that they are licensed to carry such firearms. Finally, as a message to the community in regards to what's going on out there, we will always support and protect everyone's right to peacefully protest in our city. We ask that groups do not hire armed security, but rather notify us, notify the police department of planned protests so that we can better protect those that wish to peacefully exercise their constitutional rights. And I'm happy to address any questions the council may have. Thank you, Jerry. Um, excuse me. Uh, Council Member Silva. Thank you very much, Interim Chief Hill. How, my recollection is there have been um, protests in front of the Planned Parenthood offices for years. Am I incorrect? No, you're not incorrect. The uh, 40 Days for Life group is typically out there at about this time of year, and it is for 40 days. It's what the name implies. They do usually come out here. They're very cooperative with us. They have been in the past. They notify us ahead of time when they're coming. They give us their contact information of who's in charge in the event that there are any incidents. So they have been coming here uh, for, for many, many years, and we really haven't had much issue until this year. Is there any, have there frequently been two sides out protesting at the same time? Occasionally, but it's, it's fairly rare. It's fairly uncommon. This year is different. I think the uh, political climate of the entire country right now has changed the dynamics of these sort of events. And I think of, because of what we're seeing with the a Supreme Court nomination, I think that is probably causing people to get out there and be more proactive and more active in the community. I think that's, that is a cause for why we're seeing the uh, opposing groups out there this year. And there was um, one speaker who mentioned the use of the sidewalk. Can you, or maybe the city attorney, elaborate on what's allowed on sidewalks and et cetera? Sure, I'll be happy to do that. And the city attorney, if I miss anything, you can chime in. Um, 
people are not allowed to block the sidewalk to prevent the free passage of others from using the sidewalk. That is prohibited. We have not had any instances of that, that actually occurring. The protesters are on the sidewalk, but being there and taking up space on the sidewalk is not the violation. The violation occurs when somebody is trying to use the sidewalk and can't get by and has to go out into the street to get around. We have not any, had any reports of that at this point. If that it were the case, then that would be a violation of the law. Give us some authority to certainly ask for compliance and potentially uh, cite people. But uh, we have not had a, a, an incident of that occurring this year or in years past. I also heard, you know, the grapevine is notoriously incorrect, but I also heard that it took an extraordinary amount of time for Walnut Creek PD to get to the incident. How much did somebody call right away or was there a delay or were we delayed? Um, so there was a delay on this particular incident and it, there was a 911 call that came in that reported that there was opposing factions of protesters out there and that somebody had been pepper sprayed. The information that we got was that the parties had since dispersed or had, had separated and there was no active what we call a disturbance at that time. The officers that work that part of town, as you're aware that our office, our city is divided into sectors and calls for service are typically dispatched to those who work in that sector. The officers who were assigned to that sector of town were busy on another call. And because the information that we received was that the, the, S, the disturbance was not active and the parties had separated, uh, there was a judgment call made to delay and wait for that officer to become available, primarily because the officers who work that part of town are very familiar with the disturbances that go on there. Uh, this particular officer had been called to Planned Parenthood on many occasions, knew the, uh, the players involved, and, and was very familiar with the situation. And the supervisor made the judgment call to hold it and wait until the officer was available to respond. Uh, in hindsight, that was probably not the best call. And uh, and going forward, we certainly won't be holding calls again, but that was a, a judgment call that was made on that day. But to clarify or confirm, the 911 call caller indicated that the disturbance was over. That the parties had separated and yeah, the disturbance had ended. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Does anybody else have additional questions of the Interim Police Chief, um, Mayor Portem. Thank you, and, and thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna call you Chief Hill for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is the Lieutenant that's in charge of, plan, uh, that's in touch with Planned Parenthood, is that uh, Lieutenant Lofter? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, was there, I heard again, probably the same grapevine that Council Member Silva was on. I heard that the reason given by the protesters of Planned Parenthood uh, for having armed guards is that somebody was assaulted by a counter protester in the past. Was that, do we have any indication that that's true? I'm not aware of an assault taking place, certainly not a documented assault. Um, and I don't know if by assault you could mean verbal or they could mean verbal, a verbal assault. I think they I'm said physical sure. actually. They said physical assault? Yeah. I'm not aware of a physical assault between protesters taking place prior to that. That doesn't mean it didn't occur, I'm, but I'm not aware of that. Okay, all right, that, that would be good to, um, to debunk if that's the case. Uh, and then lastly, is uh, it, it sounds like the pepper spray incident and, and the spraying there, is that a judgment call that's going to be made by a Walnut Creek Police Department or is that a judgment call that'll be made by the DA's office? And, in terms of filing charges? Correct. Yeah, well, that is I, a, know, I know the DA's office determines filing charges, but is the judgment in terms of if it were uh, an act of self-defense, is that judgment made by the Walnut Creek Police? No, that, we are fact gatherers. We go out there, we collect the evidence, we take statements, we collect video, and we present all of that to the district attorney. And so we're not making any judgment calls here on whether or not the use of force was justified. Uh, that is for the district attorney to decide after taking, listening to all the statements and watching all of the video evidence. Okay, and so again, I just, I just wanna reiterate, and I know you stated this before, but I just wanna be as clear as possible. The reason that you didn't make any arrests on the spot 
is because for misdemeanors that you don't personally witness, you are not able to make arrests. And is that the case with any misdemeanors in the city? So any misdemeanor that's not committed in our presence, the only authority that we have to make an arrest is with a citizen's arrest with a few exceptions. There's domestic violence exceptions and there's some DUI exceptions. So there are a few exceptions to the misdemeanor not committed in our presence rule. This, an assault, is not one of them. So our only authority to make an arrest that day would have been through a citizen's arrest, which to my knowledge was not requested uh, by any citizens. It, again, I, I hope I'm not incorrect here. To my knowledge, a citizen did not ask for a citizen's arrest. Okay, thank you. The, uh, Mayor, those are the questions I have, but I uh, will have a couple of comments afterwards during our, um, our brief statements. Can I okay. reiterate, that's the California Penal Code? That's that correct. Referring to. It's not local ordinance. That's a, yeah. you're adhering to the California Penal Code. Okay. The misdemeanor arrest rule, yes. Okay. Um, may I may I switch gears and go to the city manager, please? I have just a few questions, Madam Oh, Mayor. sorry. I'm sorry, Matt, Did would you uh, continue? Thank you, Interim Chief Hill, for the update. Did, one question that wasn't asked, was access to the clinic ever impacted as far as you can tell? As far as I can tell, physical access, no. But it is my understanding that people who were desirous of using the clinic saw what was taking place and people uh, continued driving by and maybe some, some uh, potential patients chose not to attend that day. But as far as I'm aware, no physical access uh, was, was being blocked. Thank you. And then this is more of a big picture item. I, it sounds like PD has taken very proactive steps in terms of Planned Parenthood and being there Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I, I really appreciate that as I imagine there a lot of members of the community do that you're there and making sure that everyone has a right to peacefully protest while not assaulting or injuring anyone else. Um, is there any other proactive measures we as a city or council can take to ensure something like this wouldn't happen in the future? Um, not necessarily as to Planned Parenthood, but to any kind of scheduled protest. I, I don't know if I can uh, answer that adequately. If there's something that you can do as council members to prevent this from occurring in the future. Uh, we do everything we can as a police department to ensure the uh, ability of protesters on any side of the fence to do so peacefully and to do so safely. And, uh, and that's what we're here for. We work closely and collaboratively with anybody who offers us that ability to do so in advance to ensure their safety. Uh, and when the need arises, we will be there if, if we're called for. Um, I don't know if I have an answer to your question about, is there anything you can do? I, I'm really not sure that there is. Okay, thank you. Okay, did I ignore anybody else that wanted to have an, a, no. Okay, now may I have the city manager respond? Yeah, Dan Buckshy, city manager. Um, happy to provide uh, another update to mayor as, as you and the council are aware on September 15th, we've provided a comprehensive update on all the actions that the county has taken and continues to take relative to the officer involved shooting that occurred on June 2nd, 2019. I'll run through at a high level a few that uh, have occurred. First off is that uh, while your council had to eliminate $12 million from the current year budget that took effect in July. You added $600,000 towards these efforts, uh, which obviously um, was not an easy allocation to make, but I think it speaks to the priority level of which you've uh, placed uh, these efforts. So a few of the activities are underway. One of the, the most important, I believe, from the perspective of the council as well, what we've been hearing from FOSAF and other uh, members of the community is to have a non-law enforcement response for mental health emergencies. Uh, we had been working on this with the county and other cities and making some progress uh, late 2019, early 2020, and then COVID hit and then unfortunately it was put on hold for uh, 
about four or five months while we worked through that. However, um, back in July, uh, mayor actually in June, and then again in July, you sent a request to the County Board of Supervisors to help support a countywide effort. The mayors, all 19 mayors, the mayor's conference in July supported that effort. And there was another update that was given, I believe it was at the September mayor's conference. Uh, the direction from the mayor's conference was to create a working group between the county and the city managers, of which I am one of the, the active members. And I'm very happy to report that tremendous progress is, is being made on that front. Uh, the county applied for and received a $315,000 grant from a hospital foundation in which to lead the planning efforts and outreach and program formulation. We're meeting on a weekly basis, the six city managers, as well as up to 10 members of the county team. We have the county health director, we have the behavioral health director, we have the deputy health director, we have the uh, homeless services lead, there is a project manager, data analyst, and process improvement specialists that all have been dedicated to this effort. And it's an extremely high priority. And I would just add that many of these folks are the same ones that are leading the county's effort to COVID, which as we all know is much more intense than that of even cities because they are leading up the public health response, those very same people. So this is amongst their highest priorities. Uh, we are in the midst of um, gathering data from mul multiple uh, police departments and the sheriff's department cities so that uh, ultimately a good assessment can be made of what's happening currently. So what does the data suggest? Their process improvement folks are also going to do ride-alongs and observe firsthand what's occurring. And before too long, uh, stakeholder outreach will be underway. And as I understand it, some members of the Friends of Scott, Lexus and Tom Hall have already been contacted including Gigi Crowder of NAMI, and I believe the halls themselves have been contacted by the county in order to invite their participation into this process. What the goal is, is to finish the stakeholder outreach by the end of November, and then December uh, begin the program design for what this may look like on a countywide level, recognizing there could possibly be some regional variation, but premature to state what that would look like until the full scope of what's occurring now is underway. So I am uh, extremely pleased, uh, candidly, at the way the county has stepped in to help. And candidly, that is a direct result of your city council making that request and urging all the other cities to get on board. And we are obviously an active leader in this in this group. Secondly, is that uh, we are looking at increasing the crisis intervention team and training for our PD officers. While maybe in an ideal world, uh, PD may not have to respond to anything or any types of calls, but as we all know, that's not the world we live in. And so there are some instances in which folks are in a crisis that is violent. Uh, and those that are not violent, the goal is to have a non-PD response, but those that are violent or potentially violent may warrant a PD or law enforcement response. And the goal is um, Chief Hill has been working with the chiefs from Martinez, Pleasant Hill and Concord to have a regional approach that at any one point in time, we have at least one team between the four cities that are on duty that have enhanced crisis intervention training even beyond what they already received so that they can help diffuse the situation, possibly in concert with uh, uh, clinicians or therapists or possibly as a, a sole PD response. In addition, and this was the result of conversations with FOSAP, that uh, we add more non-lethal um, uh, responses and options to the PD force. We have added what are called bola wraps, which are effectively like a, uh, think of, a, of a, a rope netting that would be shot out and in theory envelop somebody and, and detain them from moving. Uh, we have a few of those that are being folks are being trained on. I don't know that we've yet deployed one, which is a good thing that we've not had to do so. And then there are also uh, every vehicle now the PD purchased 33 additional beanbag shotguns, which are non lethal. And I believe our, our officers in the field have all been trained on those. Additionally, your council may recall that a um, about a month or so ago, maybe a little bit more, I lost track of COVID time. You did uh, make an expenditure to enhance our body-worn cameras with upgraded technology. 
which also will replace and upgrade the tasers that are used by PD so that they will be more accurate. And also there are additional safety features in that if a taser or a handgun is removed from the holster, the body-worn camera will automatically engage. It will also automatically engage if sirens are turned on in a PD car and it will also based on um, uh, geographic information about other officers that turn on their body-worn camera it will automatically alert other officers and or turn on their cameras that are in geographic proximity. So considerable upgrades in terms of uh, non-lethal options as well as hopefully what will result in increased transparency. And just as a reminder, your council committed to body-worn cameras initially over five years ago, and we've had them in place for a number of years now. And uh, they've proven to be very helpful in terms of identifying what's occurring out in the field. Uh, we are in the midst, as your, your council is aware, there has been a comprehensive review of the eight can't wait criteria and use of force, and we meet the vast majority of those. There are a couple candidly that our PD thinks that our practices are actually more advanced than the eight can't wait because a few of them are outdated suggestions. Community listening sessions, which was a request by the FOSAF team, again, that's the friends of Scott Alexis and Tom Hall. We have a couple of our staff members that worked with that team to create the community listening sessions that are underway currently. And um, more groups will be identified and there will be a, a large report out uh, towards the end of the year and your council will receive an update either in January or February. And then one of the other major initiatives um, is that there was the Chief's Advisory Board that was uh, created by former Chief Chaplain we had over 70 applicants and uh, which a member of FOSAF, our community relations manager and our police chief interviewed 70 individuals and ultimately 16 were selected. And they have been um, closely involved in um, actively participating in the listening sessions as well as many of these other initiatives, uh, their advice and input has been sought up front. I'll be done here in just a moment. Uh, we have a couple others here, but um, we also expanded and allocated as part of the $600,000 that your council allocated up to 400,000 is to help pay for the listening session, support the diversity and inclusion task force, which I'll come back to in just a moment. And to also increase the amount of training for all city staff uh, related to implicit bias, diversity, and inclusion, and the ability to help identify human trafficking. In addition, our um, PD will receive more mental health response training than what they do currently. The goal is to begin training, uh, providing some of this training to the PD in December, uh, roll it out to all employees and have all this training complete by June of 2021 as the current target. With respect to the diversity and inclusion task force, we were actually moving full speed ahead on this and put the brakes on it at the request of FOSAF. They felt it was moving too quickly and they wanted the uh, listening sessions to occur prior to the diversity and inclusion task force being formed and, and operating, even though they are two very independent efforts. We did agree to that. So we will pull it off the shelf here as soon as we get through the listening sessions and pick that up and move forward. And I should note that uh, FOSAF members were involved in the selection of the consultant that is being used for the listening sessions as well as for the diversity and inclusion task force. It's Jason Seals and Associates, and they were selected to operate both. And then lastly, uh, the request uh, from FOSAF and the Hall family has been to have an independent investigation of the officer involved shooting. As we've made very clear uh, at the city, we do believe that the district attorney's review is independent. The district attorney is not part of the city and they are independently elect uh, she is independently elected by the voters, does not report to the voter, voter to supervisors and reports only to the people. That said, uh, there are some that believe that uh, she is biased and would be unable to issue a uh, clean report, if you will. So we have agreed that after that report is done, in addition to us releasing all of our internal findings and reports, we would jointly ask with the district attorney that the attorney general's office consider um, reviewing and, and request them to review and do their own look into the findings from the district attorney and of the case itself, which obviously would be done at the sole discretion of the attorney general. 
And uh, hopefully that uh, covers what you were looking for, Mayor. Thank you very much. Well, well, Council Member like Silva, like wait, whoa, whoa. Member Silva goes first. Um, thank you very much for the update. And I appreciate the update in particular on what's been happening both with the listening sessions and the um, work with the county and the other cities on the non-law enforcement response to mental health crises. And just for clarification, it's not that one doesn't exist. This would be an augmentation to make it 24 by seven of what the county already offers in terms of its mobile crisis response. Am I correct in that? Yeah, potentially. They're, um, so currently there are actually two programs. One is the mobile crisis response team, which is for adults, which there is one team. And as you noted, it is not 24 seven. I believe it is six days a week, about 12 hours a day, but not 24 seven. And then there's actually, uh, that program has been around a couple of years and there's a longer standing program which is a bit confusing, admittedly, that the county has. It's called the Mobile Response Team, or MRT, as opposed to MCRT, and that is for children and families. And that's been in place for a while. That is also 24-7. So effectively, you know, what this will likely result in, and again, I don't want to get ahead of the process that's underway in terms of examining options, but we can look at uh, either expanding the program that's in place, expanding and modifying or enhancing, or coming up with an entirely new program. And uh, I don't know which way ultimately will be recommended at this point as, as the options are all still being evaluated. And your experience as a county administrator, albeit not for Contra Costa, it was for San Luis Obispo, the funding for this that comes from the state is, not I'm gonna say it as a negative, is not insignificant. County does receive a significant amount of money from the state uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars for mental health services. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, given that we're in an economic downturn and the county has a very large deficit, I believe well over a hundred million dollars, we know that the state has a $54 billion uh, gap in its budget, uh, funds are being tightened. So the county has made it clear that uh, additional funding would be needed that they likely would be unable to foot the full bill. Uh, what we intend to do once we have a better sense of what would be put in place, what the cost would be, would be to go to our state legislators, seek a grant or some type of funding from the state for this type of program. I believe this is exactly what uh, the state would be looking for counties to do in partnership uh, with cities and hopefully we could, could obtain funds there. Uh, if not, uh, we may have to look at alternative funding sources and some type of a partnership between the city and the county, the cities and the county. And I would just note that uh, Walnut Creek, uh, your council is part of the 600,000, set aside $100,000 as startup funding for this program on Walnut Creek's behalf, which to my knowledge, we are the only city that has done so to this point. Speaking of funds, one of the requests or questions was, when will the council hear um, how the funds are, the 600,000 is being if basically spent and tracking that. We have a finance committee meeting and then um, the current love, uh, financial update is coming to council, I think, the second meeting in November. Can that just be included as that, as a, an aside part? Yeah, yeah, we can provide an update on um, what's been spent to date. Uh, effectively, the only money that's been truly allocated or spent is the money for the consultant for the listening session and diversity inclusion staff task force. About $60,000 has been allocated for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Mayor Pertin. Thank you. Um, yeah, Dan, Dan, I don't know if you just knew all that off the off the top of your head or not, but that was pretty impressive running down that in our list. And I would imagine there's probably only a few people in all of Walnut Creek that could probably do that. So I'm, I'm wondering, is there a place, just a, an easy link access somewhere on the city website that could show all the things that we have been doing along with a timeline, just for people that are interested? Because we hear this pretty much every meeting that the city council hasn't done anything or words to that effect. And it would be really helpful, I think, for many people that aren't able to watch every city council meeting, to just see an easy one-page sheet exactly what's been happening and what is still to occur. Uh, yes, that is a, a, a great point. And it is either up already and admittedly, um, 
I don't know exactly where it is on our website at the moment. Uh, and if it's not up there and easily accessible, it will be before long. That's something we've been talking with our folks who manage the website to make sure that we can easily um, provide folks that information if they're interested in looking at it. Great. So, um, yeah. Okay. Hey, are we ready to move on? It looks like it. Um, so item number four is council member and staff announcements, reports on activities or requests. City attorney, got anything to tell us? Madam Mayor, we did not have a closed session today and, and consequently there are no reportable actions. Thank you. City manager, do you still have anything left to tell us? You would think not, but I do actually have a couple of things uh, briefly. Um, okay. Did want to note that uh, in my role as emergency services manager and more importantly as our communications manager, um, Betsy Burkhardt has been closely tracking, obviously, of then the public safety power shutoff um, announcements from PG&E. We did have about 400 residents in Walnut Creek that were impacted that lost their power last week, those that live in a certain area closer to Lime Ridge. Uh, there is the possibility of red flag warnings again later this week, and we may have, it appears right now, a fairly small number of folks, possibly 50 or less that could have their power shut off. And again, this is at the determination of PG&E working with the state to determine what areas could be at risk based upon weather forecasts. So we are tracking that uh, closely. And I would just note uh, that your council did authorize on the consent agenda earlier an agreement with PG&E so that the Tice Valley um, Community Center or gymnasium effectively that, that facility can be used as a community resource center by PG&E and we'll have a generator backup. So folks who are without power can go there uh, to either get out of the heat, uh, charge their equipment, uh, use restrooms, uh, have water and the like. And PG&E does staff those, we are, we are providing the facility. So hopefully the heat here uh, dissipates and it actually turns to fall and we can put this uh, this part of our challenge behind us, but uh, we're at the mercy of, of mother nature, obviously. And then the last thing I just wanted to note again that uh, we have two weeks from tonight before election day or election evening, and that there are three locations for folks to drop off their ballots. We do have a ballot drop box at Walnut Creek at City Hall. That is on the Broadway side near the parking lot at the, at the back there. There is also a drop box at the Ignacio Valley Library, which is 2661 Oak Grove Road. And then lastly, there is a drop box at Grace Presbyterian Church at 2100 Tice Valley Road. So we do have uh, facilities spread throughout most sides of the city that folks can drop those off. And uh, the county is checking those and emptying those regularly. And, that is, concludes my update for this evening. Mayor. Thank you. Can I ask the city manager a question about the, the voting locations? Okay, you were sort of did already, but continue. I believe we also have in Walnut Creek in about 10 days, an early voting site at Heather Farm Community Center. Yes, we will. We're working through the details with the county now and uh, information will be going out when that is set up and available for folks. That's correct. But it, it is not available until Friday, October 30th. That's correct. And the clerk is nodding. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, let's go Let's go to council member reports. Uh, council member Waddell. Nothing to report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Council member Francois. I thought I would have more time to get ready. Uh, I will, uh, I participated in the community service day, which got rebranded as a community food drive on October 10th with my son, Andrew, through his boys team charity group. We were at the Rossmore Safeway and I just want to applaud the community service day organizers for pivoting and making uh, such a worthwhile event at this time. And I have to say in the two or three hours that we volunteered, the number of people that volunteered were so excited to give money and food was really heartwarming and overwhelming and people were very generous. And uh, so that was a really cool thing to participate in. And then on October 12th, I attended uh, the DRAA board meeting, virtually of course, 
we got received, I provided an update from the council on the activities that we've been uh, up to. They provided an update on what they've been doing, including their virtual concert series. Uh, there was Country Strong with Mark McKay and Music Connects the World with Sarah McKenzie, both great concerts that I watched live and any of you can watch for free uh, through the DRAA website. I, I know that Walnut Creek TV is rebroadcasting those as well. There is one more concert coming up in the series. It'll be on November 20th. The original date was going to be November 13th. It got bumped to November 20th. And it will showcase the choral and a cappella talents of our local high schools. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Northgate High School will, is participating as it is the Contra Costa School for Performing Arts, November 20th. The DRAA is also hosting a pumpkin patch and Halloween themed activities in the new Redney Plaza in front of the center, uh, both the 24th and the 25th. You have to sign up, I believe, because we are wanting to make sure that they're complying with all the county health orders. So I, there may still be some spots left, but, but check it out. They have a lot of fun activities um, in store. And I also wanna give a shout out to our recreation department who has, also has a ton of Halloween activities and fun games and things in store. So go to, to, to the arts and rec department on our website and you can see all the, all the great things that our arts department is working on. Um, there, and finally, there is a, a date for the On Broadway signature event, which will be October 2nd of 2021. And we all have all decided that we will continue to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Lesher Center, which is actually this year, next year when we can uh, celebrate in person. And that's, that's my report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Silva. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I'm gonna start by saying, Kevin, thank you very much for raising the question of where can we find information on our public safety and equity initiatives. And in fact, it is on the city website because I found it, it's under the government tab. And so um, it's there and it'll be regularly updated. So it's fairly easy to find and hopefully it will also be promoted on the homepage as well. So I will start with talking about the community service day and the food drive. Yes, it was on Saturday, October 10th. And because of the hard work of the community, we had people collecting contributions and food at eight local grocery stores and at Rossmore. We had 20 community groups that were collecting food. We had 37 people that were in neighborhoods and we had almost every neighborhood covered. And in the end, we collected 38,500 pounds of food, which is another way of saying 19 tons, which um, the best we ever did was three years ago when we collected 10,000 pounds. So this was monumental. Um, I should show the pictures because food was lined up. Cars, there was a traffic jam of cars rolling into Heather Farm Community Center area to deliver the food that they'd collected in neighborhoods. We also collected $15,000 in cash contributions, which translates to 30,000 meals. So this is a tremendous outpouring of community support in a time of wildfires, COVID and economic stress. And um, so thank you to all members of the community. And I would like to thank my council colleagues, Matt, for your work with your son up at Rossmore Safeway, Kevin, for your work at the Knob Hill grocery store and mayor for visiting every one of the sites that was around the community, as well as helping in that sea of food that um, was at Heather Farm. And it took five trucks um, to get, and not, those were not pickup trucks, they were box trucks. It took five box trucks to get everything back to the um, food bank. So um, thank you again. I would mention um, as liaison to Walnut Creek downtown, I attended their board meeting a week ago and they are very appreciative of the work we did at the last meeting to adopt um, a, an emergency ordinance to cap the delivery service fees. And they've talked about other things that are going on and the work they're trying to do. But I will mention that the level of uncertainty that they're feeling in terms of downtown businesses and the future is high. And so they appreciate anything that we are doing through the rebound program, et cetera, to try to help businesses survive this time. 
Part of that um, to try to get people to come downtown is the arts programs. And I'll mention that I was out walking this morning with a friend and the murals in the Duncan Arcade are in progress. It looks like two of them are done. We saw an artist painting the third and therefore there are two palettes out of five that still remain. These are very large walls that line the Duncan Arcade. The Duncan Arcade is directly across the street from the um, Fountainhead and the Bank of America on Main Street at Duncan. And if you find the barber pole, just walk in the passageway and you will be able to experience these great pieces of art that are happening and be able to talk to the artists because they're a work in progress. Um, as the council may remember, the, I was the council liaison to the county for the census. The 2020 census concluded as of last um, Thursday, October 15th. I'm sure everyone was very concerned that everyone didn't get counted, but um, it looks like we achieved in Walnut Creek an 81.2% response rate just for self responses. And then it looks like we got to 99.9 .9 because enumerators did get into the other neighborhoods. And I want to congratulate the mayor pro tem because his neighborhood was the top self response rate neighborhood at 91.6%. And all of that data is available at 2020census.org, which is the US Department of Census website. The um, League of California Cities Annual Conference was just about two weeks ago. A lot happened. The mayor pro tem represented us during the General Assembly. I will let him report on that. But I will mention that I attended two sessions on police reform, social justice, and the National League of Cities um, real presentation, which was really good to be able to see it a second time. That is about race and equity. And really about one of the highlights to me is really beginning to understand the difference between individual racism, structural racism and systemic racism. And I think our diversity and inclusion task force will really be looking at the structural racism starting within the city as well. But I know nonprofit organizations are beginning to talk about it as well. And so hopefully we'll be able to think about that. The um, league is sponsoring a webinar next Monday, which I will forward the um, email that I received on that. It is called Trauma Informed Response to Protests. And it is really in anticipation of unfortunately protests that might occur following the November 3rd election. And it's really to focus on how we can help support our communities in a time of protests and crisis, because this could be quite stressful. And finally, I will mention that I did attend and participate in the ABAG executive board meeting last Thursday evening where they were receiving input on the housing methodology for the next eight year arena cycle. And um, the ABAG executive board, which is 36 elected members across the nine counties representing cities and um, the nine counties of the Bay Area did vote 26 to 10 to move it forward. It has some interesting concerns in it, but I will point out that um, Walnut Creek is slated to jump from 2,235 housing units, which is what we are required to accommodate during this 2015-2023 um, RENA cycle. It is going to bump our number to 5,730, 5, which is a 256% increase. Yes, with my handy dandy calculator, I did that tonight. Fortunately, two downtown specific plans will help set the framework of moving forward, but there are only some cities are, that are getting these increased numbers. It was not uniform across Contra Costa, but our Contra Costa cities were uniform in saying it wasn't right that these six cities, which is La Mirinda, Walnut Creek, Danville, and San Ramon were taking all of the burden that all of the cities wanted to be able to take the burden and share it, but also they wanted Santa Clara County and San Mateo County to take more of the share since that's where the jobs are. Um, what will happen going forward is that this will be socialized Bay Area wide, the methodology, and then come back. But we have opportunity to comment and protest. 
and perhaps protest all the way to the Housing and Community Development Department of the state in the winter and summer months of 2021. So we need to think about what we want to do there and how we point out that if you put more jobs in the East Bay and the North Bay, which is what they are doing, or more housing, if they're further from the jobs, it means more vehicle miles traveled and increase in greenhouse gas emissions, not a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and basically a reduction in overall quality of life across the Bay Area. And um, thank you very much, Mayor, for the opportunity to report. You're welcome. Mayor Pro Tem, please. Thank you. Well, as council members, I represented the city with the League of Cities uh, for one of the issues that we were talking about, which was that social media needs to take responsibility and would be held liable uh, if there is instigation that uh, occurs that would encourage people to loot and commit crimes in cities, much as we saw, of course, that happened on May 31st um, of, uh, of this year here. And so it was a uh, robust discussion with a lot of people uh, taking, topic, uh, taking discussions of that. And as I recall, we actually didn't have a quorum um, that we were able to vote on, but we had a recommendation that this would then uh, be able to move forward for a um, uh, discussion with, um, with the entities for the league and the, and the state. So that was, uh, it was interesting to hear because the, most of the cities that wanted to support that had some kind of crime that had occurred in their city or next to them. And the cities that didn't want to support it hadn't experienced any kind of a looting event. So it was interesting to see when it happened in somebody's own backyard. Uh, I wanted to mention quickly about County Connection that ridership is down. It's down across all transit agencies and that plans are beginning to form with other transit agencies, including BART, about reduction in service come July. Uh, if schools open, this could change plans, but community outreach will begin in a few months to determine the public's attitude about taking public transit during the current phase of the pandemic. Now, lastly, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about the protest and counter protests that occurred at Planned Parenthood last week. And thank you, Chief Hill, for your synopsis of the events that surrounded that. As we saw, this did receive wide media coverage and was disturbing to many people. I personally received many emails and calls on this, including from Pan Planned Parenthood. And first off, I wanna emphasize that the director of Planned Parenthood had nothing but complimentary things to say about the Walnut Creek Police Department, and especially Lieutenant Lofter, who's been a valued resource for them for several years. She was effusive in her praise, and it was understood the delay in Walnut Creek Police Department's response was because the urgency of the event at hand had subsided. And, and Planned Parenthood told me this as well. So it's not just the Chief Hills and, and Walnut Creek Police Department's view of this. They feel confident that if there had been an immediate emergency crisis, the police would have been quickly there. And I'm glad to hear that our police department will now be responding quickly to any calls of assistance from Planned Parenthood. And from what we've seen in what Chief Hill said, two things happened which exacerbated the situation of Planned Parenthood beyond the usual protest that's in front of their office. First, several armed guards were brought in by the protesters, which is as close to a private police force as I've seen in our city. And the second thing that occurred is that counter protesters appeared and came within close contact of the first group of protesters. Videos I've seen, and I believe there are others that have not made, made available to the public yet, show that these counter protesters were confronting the original protesters from a close proximity, though not physically touching them and asking to walk on the sidewalk uh, or saying they were going to walk on the sidewalk. At some point, one of the private guards pepper sprayed several of the protesters, counter protesters, as we heard, and therein lies the confrontation. And that's serious and cannot be made light of. Thankfully, it didn't escalate beyond that, but based on the weapons the guards had, it looks like those guards were there to intimidate and prepared for an escalation. And in speaking with the local director of Planned Parenthood, as well as the CEO for Planned Parenthood in Northern California, the Walnut Creek location is one of their top three problematic locations for incidents in Northern California. We talk about Walnut Creek being a safe city, but we need to protect not just residents that are going about their business living here, but also visitors to any of the businesses that are in Walnut Creek, as well as protesters. We support people exercising their First Amendment rights, but we wanna make it safe, as safe as possible for everyone without people being harmed or threatened. So following the incident that the, uh, that the police department released a statement, which also included, the city also supports the rights of people to seek safe access to healthcare facilities. So that includes Planned Parenthood, John Muir, Kaiser, or any healthcare facility. And as we've heard, Police Chief Hill 
spoke with the plan, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood protesters and asked them not to bring private security guards in the future. And let me firmly state that I am opposed to private guards being brought in by protesting groups, which more often than not lead to provocations and heightened altercations. If indeed these guards were hired out of Texas, that's a great concern as well, since Texas has very different weapons laws than we have. And to keep Walnut Creek safe, I'd like to propose we begin to look into drafting a buffer zone ordinance, similar to what the two other problematic locations for Planned Parenthood have for their Napa and San Francisco locations. Essentially, it prohibits interference with reproductive health care facilities by prohibiting harassment or following any person within 25 feet of the entrance of a reproductive health care facility. It could also have a buffer zone to keep different protesting groups apart and not, and not block public access ways like sidewalks. This would prevent altercations like this from occurring in the future. I'm also particularly concerned about women who have to go through a gauntlet of attempted intimidation to seek medical advice and care. As we heard from Chief Hill, we don't know, but perhaps some cars slow down and then they didn't end up going in there to, to meet with healthcare um, uh, clinical physicians or nurses or, or any doctors. Again, I want to stress that Planned Parenthood told me several times they have nothing but the highest regard for the Walnut Creek Police Department and Lieutenant Lofter in providing them with excellent collaborative assistance. While it's not up to me to put a discussion for this ordinance on the agenda, I would like to ask that we do so as soon as city staff is able to, as this is a public safety issue. And those are my comments. You're on, you're on mute, Mayor. Probably a good thing. So pretty much anything I say is an anti-climax, but here we go. Um, my classes at the League of Cities focused on the pensions and the tsunamis and that, that are looking down at us and um, what can be done. And it inspired me to, um, to see if we can get more elected officials on the pension board because um, they have been largely run by unions and we need to get the people who have to pay for it, um, of the representatives of the people who are paying for those pensions um, to make sure that it's done, um, not to cheat anybody out of, of what they entitled to, but to make sure that it's done um, responsibly, which sometimes I think I, I can say kind of fearfully, I don't think they did. Um, and the other thing I uh, studied was the ethics um, in particular, what happened um, down south um, and how um, it, uh, that poor little city whose name begins with, uh, I can't remember the name, Bell, Bell, yes, Bell. Oh, how clever. Um, the Bell, Bell how, how it all just kind of fell apart. And I am proud to say that as they were making suggestions about what cities can do to prevent future Bell um, we as a community, as a city, have instituted um, those, um, those things and more to make sure that we don't fall into the, the trap. Um, one fun thing I got to do was introduce both of the Lesher Theater movies um, in the top floor of the parking. Um, it was fun to see all the families getting together in their little padded out pods. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we can do that more um, uh, as time, as the weather permits. Um, let's see, I attended the Innovate 680 meeting. I'm on a special committee um, that is watching and will be helping set policy on the 680 improvements. And we meet quarterly and we're still in our training phase, um, but they had some pretty impressive um, animations about suggestions for improving the traffic, uh, particularly in the bottleneck that is the connection between 24 and 680 in Walnut Creek. Um, I also, in my own little way, participated in the great shakeout, um, which was a uh, city staff, um, but I think bigger than the city staff um, practice drill on what to do in the case of an, an earthquake. And what I found out was 
at some point it's not as easy to get under your desk as it was when you were eight years old. But I managed to get almost all me under my desk except for my feet. Um, but it's um, drop, the, the, the rules are drop, cover your head and, and neck with one arm to protect yourselves and hold on to wherever you are um, because whatever you're thinking you're safe under might be moving too. So you wanna keep your safety net um, over you. Um, I went to the TransPAC meeting and I think there was lots of technical stuff. Um, I got to hear one more version of their vehicle miles traveled. Um, but I think the thing that will be of most interest is there is a rebate program for e-bike purchases. Um, and it's done by um, 511 uh, Contra Costa. And if you go on their website and you look for the eBay, it could be up to $150 um, per person. And um, if you qualify for a low income uh, rebate, it could be $300 um, for the bike. And um, that's one way I think to encourage people to think about commuting on um, their bikes. Um, I'm going to say that it is time for a break and uh, let's meet together at uh, 7.40-ish. So seven, oh no, that's only three minutes. That's too short of a break. Um, seven, um, 7.48, nine, 10, sold, 7.50. See you then.
Welcome back. Next on the agenda is the consideration items. Um, the, con the first consideration item is the uh, resolution adopting rethinking mobility and transportation strategic plan. At this time, I invite the staff to make the presentation. Hi. How's it going, Mayor and members of the City Council? Great to see you all again. Uh, Carrie McNichol will be sharing her screen. She's the consultant that will be presenting with me tonight. Uh, it's been a yeah, it's been a while, but we are excited to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Ozzy Arce, uh, Associate Transportation Planner with the City, and like I noted, presenting with me tonight is Carrie McNichol from Fair and Peers, the consultant for this project. We are excited to be presenting the draft transportation strategic plan, an effort we've been working on for about two years now. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to note that this is a planning, a strategic planning effort that'll provide us with a roadmap uh, for the next five years. However, as we've seen this past year, things can change, particularly in the transportation sector. And as such, we'll need to adapt to the times and changing circumstances as they come. Uh, however, the goals of reducing vehicle miles traveled, managing parking demand are still very much the same, so it's more a matter of adapting to the times. Next slide, please. Uh, tonight, uh, I'll provide an overview of the project goals and work we've done to date. Carrie will go over the 13 strategies really quickly found in the plan, and I'll highlight the strategies that we're currently working on or will work on immediately after the plan is adopted. Uh, we'll close with the recommended action, which is to approve the attached resolution, adopting Rethinking Mobility, a transportation strategic plan. Next slide. So again, I'll start with a project overview. Uh, next slide, please. As a re quick reminder, the city's general plan affirms our commitment to transportation demand management strategies. Uh, transportation demand management, or TDM for short, uh, was discussed at the last city council meeting in the context of SB 743. And this term, TDM, refers to strategies or actions that decrease dependency on single uh, occupant automobiles, increased transit use, biking, and walking. Next slide, please. It's essentially a mind shift um, from an automobile dependency to one that includes active modes as well. Uh, it's behavioral science. Next slide, please. So the plan's objectives, and I won't read these out loud, but it's essentially similar language from our general plan of, of reducing those vehicle miles traveled, managing our parking demand and increasing active modes. Next slide. So just really briefly as a, as a reminder for all of us, uh, the project was launched in the fall of 2018. City staff introduced the public to the project with some street level engagement. You may have seen us out at uh, farmer's markets or uh, wet Walnut Creek downtown's uh, first Wednesdays or by distributing information over several channels as well as uh, several meetings with commissioners and the city council. Uh, phase two, which began in winter of 2019, included the development of the Transportation Needs, Opportunities and Challenges Report, um, which assessed the city's transportation network programs and policies with respect to the primary objectives identified for the plan. Uh, the report includes information on where people are driving, public transit options, biking and walking, and how mobility is changing. Uh, phase three of the project occurred in the spring and summer of 2019. And this was a key phase of the project because it included identifying and evaluating the potential strategies. Uh, during this phase, staff and the consultant team hosted two joint workshops with the Transportation and Planning Commissions to help establish the guiding principles, frameworks, and target, uh, as well as begin to prioritize the strategies from the report. Again, this was a key deliverable for this phase. Um, on September 3rd, uh, 2019, uh, a little over a year ago, staff and the consultant team concluded phase three of the project by presenting the strategies report along with the themes from the Joint Commission Prioritization Workshop to the City Council. Um, in an effort to prioritize the top strategies, the City Council was asked to provide feedback on each of the four main uh, project areas, commute trips, non-commute trips, school trips, and downtown parking. Uh, the City Council discussed the benefits and trade-offs of identifying uh, 
of the identified strategies and provided input and direction moving forward on those that should be included in the draft plan. Uh, the council noted that it would like to see strategies balanced with costs and convenience. We'll also consider parking pricing strategies that promote positive customer experiences, yet also reflect market conditions. The council noted that the strategies should, should focus on addressing behavioral change and the perception of public transportation. Even more important now, right? Next slide, please. Following phase three, staff and the consultant team reviewed the feedback and input gathered from the city council on its priorities and incorporated its preferences in the draft plan, which was presented to the public in January of 2020, so earlier this year. Uh, staff and the consultant team presented the draft plan to the Transportation Commission and the Planning Commission, um, and the, both commissions reviewed and discussed the draft plan strategies and separately recommended adoption of the draft plan to the City Council without any further changes. And we were making great strides um, and we were uh, gonna come before you all on the March 17th, 2020 meeting. Um, however, that meeting was canceled uh, as a result of the COVID-19 shelter in place order. Next slide, please. Now, when the draft plan was presented in early 2020, the city was looking at a much more certain future Months later, as the impacts of COVID-19 continue to reveal themselves, the way in which we live, work, and play have dramatically shifted. Economic uncertainty, rapid shifts in how we do business, and insecurity about our own individual and collective futures necessitated the need to evaluate the relevance of the strategies included in this plan in a COVID and post-COVID-19 climate. When we saw this, what we saw this past summer, though, is that cities, including Walnut Creek through the rebound program, have repurposed roadway space from car parking to outdoor dining, created temporary walkways and bicycle paths to meet the growing need for outdoor recreation, and also found ways to reuse the curb space to accommodate a rapid increase in deliveries for food and packages, all of which echo strategies found in the draft plan. So in light of this, the proposed strategies in Rethinking Mobility have become more relevant as a way to support economic recovery while also encouraging active transportation and a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Now the ability of cities to adapt to the constantly changing conditions will be what allows them to thrive moving forward and Rethinking Mobility gives the city a toolkit to respond to and adapt to these uncertainties in a way that supports the residents, business, and vitality of Walnut Creek. So with that in mind, we'd like to present the draft plan and its 13 strategies. And so Carrie from Fair and Pierce will provide us with a quick overview. All right, now let's try now. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, Ozzy, and uh, thank you, Mayor and Council members uh, for having us here this evening. As Ozzy mentioned, I'm gonna start by just going briefly over uh, what the different components of are included in the plan. Um, it really is a, a summary document of a lot of the previous phases of work and, and combines them in totality for a complete document. Um, the guiding principles, project background, and existing conditions were all presented along with the plan frameworks and targets. The bulk of the plan is really the, the 13 key strategies um, that are each provided with a description of each strategy, um, information about the category and mode that's affected, high level information on cost, partners that are important, uh, implementation considerations, and case studies as well. These 13 strategies are supported by um, seven additional strategies that will help the city in its efforts to monitor how it's doing and continue to make progress in the future. Lastly, there are also recommendations for uh, monitoring and funding as the plan moves forward into the implementation phases. As Ozzy mentioned before, uh, the strategies are really uh, sorted into four key buckets. The first being commute trips, those made for work, non-commute trips, trips to and from schools, and then parking strategies really focused on our downtown core. 
So you'll see the 13 strategies outlined there, and we'll go through them uh, at a, a medium high level um, by bucket now. So the first uh, chunk here are the commute trips. So these are really the trips to, within, and from Walnut Creek to work. Uh, we know from the Needs, Opportunities, and Challenges report that a lot of workers uh, who travel to Walnut Creek for work are coming from destinations east of here. Meanwhile, a lot of Walnut Creek residents are, are traveling to places like San Francisco for work, or at least that they were. Um, so these strategies are really uh, designed to affect those peak commute hour trips um, by giving choice and making alternative modes of travel a little bit more attractive and competitive. So the first strategy here is TDM program reporting. Uh, this is a request for annual or biannual reporting from the largest employers in the city of Walnut Creek. This is a voluntary strategy. Uh, the monitoring will give the city a way to gauge the success of the TDM program offerings and the other strategies that we'll be outlining throughout this, doc throughout this presentation tonight. The next two are really about uh, transit, promoting transit, um, which is going to be a, a particularly interesting, um, tricky and maybe compelling thing moving forward. Uh, the first is to look at incentivizing BART use for trips to Walnut Creek, particularly from central and eastern Contra Costa County. This could involve things like uh, subsidies, workplace promotions, first and last mile promotions to make getting to and from the stations easier. And then that's paired with really transit infrastructure improvements. So this looks more at our bus transit system, making improvements on those key congested corridors that will make travel by bus uh, more competitive in term and more attractive in terms of the time it takes to travel on bus, of course, when it's safe to do so. The fourth key strategy in this bucket is the City of Walnut Creek's Commute Alternative Program. Um, the goal here is to really look at what the city does um, for their employees with the intention of serving as a model employer uh, that other employers in the city can, can base their programs off of. It's really a, a practicing what we preach effort. So this would include things like uh, looking at the variety of transportation benefits that are offered, making sure new hires have information about their commute choices, providing guaranteed ride home programs and things of that nature. The next um, set of strategies here, oops, went one too far there, uh, are the non-commute trips. So these are trips to the core area and other significant retail areas for recreation, for leisure, for dining, errands, shopping, all of those great things. Uh, we know during COVID that bike riding has substantially increased. The uh, wait list for bikes is, is growing longer in the conversations I've had with bike shop owners. Um, so in support of that, uh, provisioning of bicycle amenities, things like secure bike parking, both short-term and long-term options, as well as public repair stations within uh, the downtown area and at transit stops to make sure that people traveling by bike have end of trip facilities, just like people traveling by car hope to have. Uh, innovative mobility programs really builds upon things the city has already done. So this is looking at partnerships or pilot programs, such as car sharing, uh, pilots with uh, TNC companies like Lyft or Uber, micro mobility programs, building upon things like the existing or the pilot senior lift program and scooter share pilot that the city has previously done. The last one here is coordination with East Bay Regional Parks. This is about working collaboratively to update policies and look at where uh, the city can collaborate on infrastructure uh, to really let the trails be highlighted and serve as the true kind of backbone facilities for active transportation that they are. So this is building upon the existing kind of asset and amenity that's provided in those trails. School trips, obviously, uh, the last seven months have really dramatically impacted this one. Uh, but these strategies, of course, um, reflecting a return to whatever the new normal will be as, as schools start to go back into in-person education. Uh, will help make sure that students can safely get to and from school. These are strategies that will target both students and their families, as well as benefiting the teachers and staff at these schools. The first one is about promoting safe routes to school. This is expanding the existing Street Smarts Diablo and Contra Costa County safe routes to school programs that exist through things like looking at the infrastructure improvements that are needed around school, conducting real targeted uh, parental engagement and ideas for that to make sure that parents are comfortable and have the resources they need to let their kids bike and walk to school as well. School transit access is similar, but it looks at ways to make transit, of course, for students more accessible, whether through a freak pass, 
different programmatic activities uh, that can be built into curriculum to make buses seem more familiar and make travel by bus seem more comfortable to both students and their parents. And the last category, of course, is parking. Um, this is targeted towards both employee and commute trips to the downtown core, as well as visitors and business patrons that are traveling to the area. The strategies under the parking category um, really all work together to make sure that the city's goals around parking occupancy are being met, as well as the goal to provide a, a clear and easily understandable parking experience for people traveling to downtown. The first one, parking and curb signage, is about cl that clear communication, making sure that people know where, when, and for how long they can park uh, and for what purposes in a, in a clearly communicated way. Parking requirements for new development will build upon the work that the city has done in efforts like the North Downtown Specific Plan with setting uh, minimums and maximums for multifamily housing developments. So really looking um, at now that some of those are in place, how are they performing? Are they meeting expectations? And would it be reasonable to expand those options to other areas of the city? The next two, zone and demand-based parking pricing and municipal garage pricing, are really looking at how we price our street parking and our garage parking uh, based on where the parking spaces are located. And again, with meeting that goal of having enough spaces open for them to be easy to find. So making sure that that based on how we how we price and locate our parking, that there are a number of options that meet people where they are with what they're willing to pay, how long they'll be downtown, how far they want to walk or not, both on street and in the garages. So with that, um, I will turn it back to Ozzy to talk a little bit more about implementation and next steps. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so while the 13 strategies identified in the draft plan are intended to be implemented in whole or in part uh, within the plan's five-year time horizon, some strategies have already moved ahead as part of the rebound program or other previously approved programs. Next slide, please. The four strategies that you see on the screen are those that staff is currently focused on or will begin to implement soon after the plan is adopted. On the top left is strategy number five. We always have seen that there's been a strong demand for bike parking as reflected in the consistent public comment and feedback. Uh, the city recently installed more bike racks downtown in collaboration with the public works department and the use of recycled smart funds. Yet we know additional amenities and locations throughout the city need to be identified. Um, and to Mayor uh, Haskew's comment about the e-bike uh, rebate program, this, this may be even more important. Uh, on the top right is strategy number 10, parking and curb signage. Elements of the strategy are already being piloted through the city's rebound program. As seen here in the photo, we have a 15 minute curbside pickup signage. The strategy will continue to build upon the improvements to short term parking signage and further improve signage throughout the city so that it's clear and easy to understand. On the bottom left is strategy number 11, parking requirements for new development. So the city was fortunate uh, to receive a state grant uh, to conduct a parking study and to aid future consideration of how to right size our multifamily housing requirement. So the parking study is key to uh, this strategy and we could use, um, and really the effectiveness of the strategy could reduce the cost of new residential construction by avoiding the building of unnecessary parking spaces. And lastly, on the bottom right is strategy number 13, municipal garage pricing. And the city recently increased the hourly rate and monthly rate ranges of garages. So we're currently monitoring these changes and we'll proceed further with the strategy um, if it's warranted after the analysis is conducted on the recent changes. Next slide, please. So now in conclusion, next slide, the recommended action tonight uh, is to approve the attached resolution adopting Rethinking Mobility, a transportation strategic plan. So it's a long, long effort to get here, um, but we're excited to be here tonight uh, and hoping uh, for that recommended action. So thank you all for your, for your time. And that concludes our presentation. And now it's time for questions. And uh, so um, I'm looking at the council members to see if anybody has any questions. Um, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, we'll start with you this time. 
I can't suddenly my raised hand. I don't know. The, the whole feature is, is different. Thank you. Uh, Ozzy, thank you. Uh, good, good to see. And uh, I know that you've gone a long way to get this far. I did have one question and I'm, and you actually answered several of them along the way. So I you're obviously taking COVID into account as you are looking at this and what a post COVID world would look like. Um, sitting on the County connection, we have seen, these smaller autonomous buses, uh, they're using one in Bishop Ranch right now for a route there. And we've seen them in some of the larger uh, shows. And I'm wondering if we've had any discussions from a city perspective with County Connection of how those could be used down Ignacio Valley Road or some of the uh, more impacted commute routes that could help to bridge that uh, first mile, last mile delta, which is why people get in the cars in the first place, even to go to BART. And if that conversation has even been broached. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Will, for that question. You know, specifically to, to the autonomous fleet and county connection, we haven't engaged in a conversation around uh, that specific vehicle type. However, we engage in conversations with county connection along uh, first, last mile, uh, connectivity opportunities, um, and not just first last mile to and from the BART station, but also uh, first and last mile to and from the bus stop. So we're thinking uh, bike share, scooter share, um, things of that sort to serve more of a as a hub and a spoke idea. Um, so there are other conversations in the works, but not specifically to the autonomous fleet. Okay, great. Thank you. And I don't want to uh, miss Carrie. Thank you, Carrie, as well. And Smidar, good to see your face, too. Hello. Thank you. I just wanted to add a little bit to Ozzy's uh, answer. So just so you know, currently, uh, California state law has very specific uh, requirements for running autonomous vehicles on public streets. Uh, the city of Walnut Creek does not currently allow for that, but we do have a pilot um, autonomous shuttle uh, that is beginning, it's in its beginning stages in Rossmore, just so you're aware. Um, but otherwise, uh, the autonomous shuttle program is uh, really, it's an innovation type of project and it's actually being promoted through CCTA specifically. County Connection hasn't quite gotten engaged on the autonomous fleet um, perspective yet. Okay. Great, thanks. I'll be definitely interested to hear as uh, as time marches on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member? Uh, council member Silva. So I'd like a clarification here. We're being asked to approve this resolution tonight, but we have not seen this in a year. So I have some detailed questions and I might end up with some detailed comments. I, it doesn't mean we couldn't approve the resolution, but some of them might be notes to self for the next five years, so to speak. Is that okay, Mayor? Is that okay, staff? Because if I don't say it, I'm going to be remiss, probably. You don't want to hear it later. So um, a few of my questions. In the, um, in the report or the plan, there was um, page 30 of the report has a what I would call a bar chart. It's not a column chart. It's a bar chart that it shows for basically um, various origins of employees where they are going to one of four key destinations in terms of employment centers. John Muir, Shadelands, downtown. There had to have been another one. I can't remember what it was. Um, Shadelands Business Park? Hi. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to take that? I started to look at that and I remember it from the report a year ago. And I started to realize today that if I flipped the view and made pie charts, I would actually be able to see of John Muir's employees where they were coming from. And then if we overlaid how many employees that was, we'd have a better sense of, gee, is there a way to work with Central County and John Muir Health and figure out a solution? Do you have the ability to flip that data so that that will be helpful going forward? <laughs> and just kind of if I was doing it in my head, I figure you probably have the ability to do it. I'll defer to Carrie uh, on that. On that, where question. is she? Okay, there you are. 
I'm here. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we do have um, some more detailed data on that that city staff should have, but we'll absolutely make sure that they have all of the kind of background supporting data. Um, this was obviously kind of the high level look at this for this, this planning mm -hmm. document, but we'll make sure that they have all of that accessible to them moving forward. Well, in some ways, what I was really talking about, there was just another lens to view that chart in particular, which is, it's not a, where does everybody from Concord, where do they go? It's, if we're worried about transportation in and out of Shadelands Business Park, where are the majority of those employees coming from? And when I read that today, it doesn't look like they're coming from areas where they would be using BART. It looks like they're primarily coming from places where BART is not an option for those employees. So I find it interesting that that view might have allowed the Shadelands Business Park folks to really talk about other alternatives going forward, not just the free bus, because that's free buses are expensive. Like, so, okay. <laughs> Um, I guess that, and then I feel, because I had questions about, are we able to, one of the assumptions in the BART trips strategic section was that there are many employees coming from Central and Eastern Contra Costa that should, if they took BART, we would get cars off the road. But do we have that data that shows that coming from Central Contra Costa and Eastern Contra Costa, it actually, where those where those employees are going in the city in general, and therefore what solution, is BART really a solution, or are they in fact all going to Shadelands Business Park, which if I lived in Antioch, I would not ever get on BART to go downtown Walnut Creek to then have to get on another means of transportation to go out to Shadelands Business Park. That would be probably, you would have to pay me a lot of money to do that every day, because that's a multiple so I just wonder if we have the data that, so we can be data focused as we work on these strategies. I I'll, I think, I mean, we, we definitely have data available. It's just a matter of uh, if we're able to extrapolate specifically what you're asking. Um, Carrie, no, I, you and I don't really want the data myself. I want the data to inform these strategies as we go forward because I mean, but more generally speaking, Council Member Silva, you know, I, I, I hear you on, on your, your scenario from someone coming from Antioch, um, but really what the strategy, and I'm looking at strategy number two, is looking at hopefully changing that, 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 that behavioral change, that behavior, and encouraging folks to ride bar um, from Antioch. So while it may not be something we can do now, uh, we're hoping that some of the efforts through these strategies uh, change that behavior because BART is in Antioch. And I would agree with you if I were just, if I were going to the Golden Triangle to work, or if I was going to work at Kaiser Hospital, but if I'm, that's why I specifically said knowing the origin and the specific employment center destination is going to better inform the likelihood of behavior change. I'm trying to find questions, Mayor, and I realize that I'm having a conversation here, and that's not. I fair. understand. I think probably the rest of mine are just comments and comments that um, subsequently from public input. Okay. Any other questions, Matt? Council Member Francois. Thank you, Mayor Haskew. You're welcome. And, uh, uh, thank you to staff for the excellent presentation and for the commitment to this uh, really exciting effort, I think. Um, so just kind of foundational questions, what shuttle services exist, what free shuttle services exist today? Where do they go to and where do they come from and so on? Uh, it is my understanding that we that the two that come top of mind are the Route Four and the Five, the electric free shuttle and the and the bus that goes down to Creekside. Um, however, and I believe uh, if Andy Smith is on, I'll defer to him. But I believe County Connection just uh, started a few pilots on some key corridors uh, in Walnut Creek. So if. <laughs> There is a shuttle service that goes from Shadelands to the Pleasant Hill BART station, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. 
Yeah, I, uh, 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 Council Member uh, Francois, yes, uh, it's the Route 7 you reference, and uh, as uh, Ozzy had alluded, uh, County Connection has been using some cap and trade funds for the, a little over a year, and, and they, they're renewing it to uh, uh, have uh, free fares on the Monument Corridor routes, one of which is the 14 that actually goes from the Concord Bart to the Wanna Creek Bart, or Concord to Pleasant Hill to Wanna Creek Bart stations, serves a, a large chunk of Wanna Creek, actually, um, and so that's also free. That's great. Uh, do any of our major employers now operate any shuttle services? Does Kaiser or, or John Muir have a shuttle service from the BART station to their facility? I am not aware of one unless Andy uh, is. I've seen John Muir shuttles. I, I can't say if they're on a fixed route and schedule, but I have certainly seen them. Okay. And uh, the uh, Kaiser, of course, is well served by the uh, free route five. Um, so they, they already have a, a shuttle in that. I think I'm done with my shuttle questions, but I, I do, I'm very intrigued with this autonomous uh, shuttle service that, that the mayor pro tem has raised. And I think that would be cool to see that get off the ground at some point. Um, Ozzy, you mentioned that there were increases to the, uh, the our city garage parking rates. Can you, can you elaborate on those? I wasn't, I frankly wasn't aware of them. <laughs> So I believe through the uh, emergency ordinance this past summer, the city council approved a rate change in the garages from 50 cents to a dollar 25. Um, so that and then they increase or city council increased the rate range for monthly parkers, I believe, from $40 to $70. Um, so those two changes were made for the municipal garages, but Carla might be able to provide more detailed answers on 40 to 100. And, and actually I can clarify that those uh, changes were, uh, there was permanent changes made to the parking uh, rates uh, approved by the Transportation Commission for when parking is charged again. Uh, the municipal code grants the Transportation Commission authority to set parking, uh, the rates, the fees. So those aren't being charged right now, but once we start charging for parking again in the garage, those new rates will be in effect? They are currently not implemented. Uh, however, they have been approved by the city council. Council member Terry Kilgore, um, assistant city manager, you are correct. They have been approved, but they will not be implemented until such time as we begin charging for parking again in the garages. Um, we're beginning to track occupancy rates that may warrant um, doing that in the near future, but right now they are not in effect. And that will apply to all three of our garages, both on Locust and Broadway? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I had another question about bike. I'm just all over the place with my questions here. Bike lockers, because I, I think with the rise in e-bikes, and the re there will be increasing popularity with that. I understand that they are expensive, even with the rebates, and it would be a type of vehicle I would think, or, or a bike that someone wouldn't feel comfortable. I probably wouldn't feel comfortable just locking up a tire or the frame like I would a normal bike. So how, have we given any thought? I know BART has the bike lockers. How, those are kind of big. How would, where would we put them downtown? How would we implement that type of facility in the downtown core? Great question, uh, Council Member Francois. You know, surprisingly, and maybe a lot of people not know this, we have some at City Hall. Uh, they're just, they're, they're hiding around. Um, so they're, they're around, it's just a matter of being able to identify them. So that could be something that staff looks at, not only uh, the location in terms of, do we have the physical space, but also is it, placed in the, in, the, in the correct location? Is it visible? Um, so I, I think we would pair those two. Um, but to your point, Council Member Francois, space is, is, is limited in downtown. And so we have to get creative. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that the industry itself has also shifted um, and maybe redesigned some of these to accommodate for smaller spaces. A bigger picture question, you know, we, we had, we adopted the resolution at our last meeting uh, 
um, implementing the vehicle miles travel thresholds, and that'll be our standard going forward with uh, CEQA documents. So how, how do we correlate the trip reductions from rethinking mobility with those thresholds that we adopted two weeks ago? What, what needs to be done in order to, to make that connection? Great question, Council Member Francois. You know, it's, it's a good distinction to make uh, between these two efforts, SB 743 and this rethinking mobility effort, but there's also a relationship to make here. And so as we learned at the last city council meeting, the law that was initiated um, or the law that was passed um, intended to change how we analyze transportation impacts for the purposes of CEQA. Uh, so now we have this new metric of vehicle miles traveled as opposed to what was previously level of service. Um, level of service in the past uh, provided mitigation measures um, for vehicle delay impacts that required widening streets or changing intersection configurations. Now mitigation measures uh, for projects that have an impact, a VMT impact require actions that reduce the number of vehicle trips or the length of those trips. Um, so therefore, one of the important methods of mitigating VMT impacts will be to apply these TDM strategies that are specifically targeted towards reducing vehicle trips. So while those VMT reductions are analyzed at the individual project level, rethinking mobility provides uh, developers with a menu of options, if you will, that identifies high priority strategies that could contribute towards those VMT reductions as required under SB 743. Um, I'll say lastly, it's important to note though that there are a multitude of TDM strategies um, and many new ones still coming online. So the strategies in rethinking mobility can offer a starting point Yet developers may look at TDM strategies elsewhere, such as uh, CAPCOA, which was referenced also at the last city council meeting. So that's a long-winded way of saying, council member, that the VMT analysis that's done for SB 743 is done at a project level. It's context sensitive. And, but these TDM strategies allow developers or to pick from a menu of options in addition to other uh, TDM strategies to try to mitigate those VMT impacts for CEQA purposes. Got it. Thank you. And in, in terms of, um, there were some pilot programs mentioned in the plan, uh, like West Sacramento, and there was a reference to La, the La Mirinda bus system. W were there any takeaways from those that you thought, oh, this would really work well in Walnut Creek, we should be doing that? You know, the, what I would say the, the micro transit as it's called the pilot in West Sacramento um, was actually expanded to also include the city of Sacramento and the entire regional Sacramento regional transit. So the program grew. Um, so we're definitely following that. Um, and what I think why it grew so successfully is because it took that regional approach. Um, and so that may be an area where we can partner with CCTA to bring those online. But what micro transit is, um, it's essentially ride sharing. So Uber and Lyft and requesting a ride meets a bus. Uh, and so we can, we can consider how we can bring those through the strategy of new mobility programs, uh, which is number six. And so the, the okay that that sounds like it will certainly be the wave of the future in try in terms of trying to get people to do this mind shift like you said and I think uh, you know just my last question relates to the impact of COVID and and how nimble and flexible will be I know we're pretty aggressive in terms of our timing but I think the pandemic is sort of um, it's changed transit for sure. I know for my, myself, I would routinely commute by BART from Walnut Creek into San Francisco, and now I'm, I'm doing that by car. I, I fully expect that I will go back to BART at some point, but I suspect I'm not alone, and I'm not sure when the, the transition back to BART will happen. I suspect it won't be until mid-next year at some point at the earliest. And so we've got some, you know, some of these 
what are we calling them? Priorities, principles, these 13 ideas that we're implementing and some of them we're supposed to have done in like a year or two, but are they capable of being shifted out a year or two after that? I mean, I, I, I appreciate us wanting to be aggressive about this, but I think we have to be realistic too. Question uh, and comment, it was a two in one. It was. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, council member Francois, we have to be nimble. And if it's one thing we learned this last year is that the transportation industry uh, was definitely thrown a, a big curveball, And I, I would love to also know the answer of to when uh, BART will come back, Caltrain will come back, all these regional transit agencies, County Connection, of course. Um, but I think for us now, um, we just have to stay nimble. But we also understand, as you saw in the through the rebound program, um, a lot of these strategies have also been accelerated. Um, and so for us, it's just a, uh, what is the priority at the time? And of course, we, we can be nimble. Um, just generally, I will also point, point uh, City Council to attachment seven, which is the timing of the strategies. And so we did take a, a moment to um, reflect on that and, um, and modify the timing of those strategies. But even beyond that, uh, council member, uh, we are nimble to push those on uh, if need be. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor, for the indulgence. Those were my questions. You're welcome. Um, you owe me. Um, so so uh, the next, I guess, uh, Council Member Waddell, I'm just checking in. Okay, Got a question? You. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, and I kind of know the answer and I kind of know the argument, um, are e-bikes e allowed everywhere? I'll, I'll defer to Smadar Boardman, um, but everywhere in, this, in, in the city, but also maybe if you wanna to speak to um, our trails. Yeah, so currently uh, the way that the California Vehicle Code views bicycles, whether they're e-bikes or regular bikes, they're considered a vehicle. So they're allowed to use streets in any way that they normally would. Um, unless there's specific speed restrictions, they're allowed to use any kind of bike facility. Um, that is also available. And then uh, the East Bay Regional Parks District does allow e-bikes um, up to a certain speed on those trails, on the Iron Horse Trail, as well as the Contra Costa Canal Trail. But scooters are still not currently allowed. Thank you. Um, some, of the, some of the things, because it's, it's been on the shelf so long, um, some of the things that we were pointing out that we were cutting edge on don't exist anymore, i.e. the funny little trolleys that walked and delivered and, and the, um, the bike program, the, the line bike just petered out. Um, so that gets me to the question, which is um, how do we incorporate the next best idea that may or may not be a pilot that goes, um, that, that actually takes off or not. What do we do? And, and I have a sort of sub question to that, um, which is just the size of the city impact, how, how attractive we are for those kinds of opportunities. Great question, uh, Mayor. Uh, maybe I'll answer the, the second one is, is that yes, I would say this, the size is definitely important, but also the, the environment. And for us, we have uh, two BART stations in Walnut Creek. We have an urban downtown that's relatively close to that BART station. And so we lean on those um, resources to uh, essentially tell a story of why it's important for Walnut Creek to receive these new mobility programs. Separate from that, I think a lot of these companies, um, they research what cities have done in the past. And for us, we were fortunate to be innovators by bringing in Lime Bike through the Bike Share program. And that sent a message that even here in the suburbs in Central Contra Costa County, um, there are cities that are looking at first and last mile as solutions uh, to mitigate their traffic and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. 
So I think we've told a great story and the conversations I've had with all these shared micromobility providers, I won't say all of them, but uh, a good amount have expressed an interest in continuing to bring uh, shared micromobility or new mobility programs to the city. In don't, don't stop. If you go well, I was going to say, in short, uh, you know, they've they've tried and tested a lot of the urban areas, and I think they're also interested to understand how these type of transportation programs work in more suburban urban context as well. Thank you. Um, th this is kind of uh, what I should have done in the council member update. Um, uh, it's um, I have I have been told that the BART meeting that will be held this Thursday is something that we may wanna monitor carefully um, because they're going to be presenting um, the first round of um, discussion about what the changes in service are going to be and how it impacts each individual um, station. Um, there, there are some pretty, there's some pretty interesting um, concepts to look at and so we, might want to monitor that and make sure that um, we understand the potential impacts. Um, and that gets me to my question, which just justifies my comment. Um, and that and that is, um, what do we do if BART takes a long, long time to recover? And, and, and so much of what we are pegging our, our choices approaches depend on the fact that we are part proximate. So, I mean, five years may, it may take five years for it to recover, and we still don't even know what the labor force is and how they're going to um, behave. This is a really long question. Um, how they're going to behave when people are working remotely which we hear is going to be a case. If you can remember any of those questions, I would be happy if you would answer some or all of them. Of course, Mayor. Uh, that, I think that just goes back to Council Member Francois's question about you know, timing and how nimble we are. And I think we are also in a wait and see as far as BART ridership, uh, County Connection BART rider, or ridership as well. Um, but for us, we will focus on and work in, to implement other strategies in the plan while we uh, learn more from uh, our regional transit agencies. But I hear you. I hear you. Wow. That was a cool answer given the length of the question. Good job. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I'm going to open this to public comment. Um, so, and remember, for those of you who are doing public comment, um, all the public comment has to relate to this item only. Um, City Clerk, are there any, um, is there any public comment? Um, we have one hand raised, Melissa. Um, I really would like to address what uh, interim chief hill was saying so i don't think it's appropriate for me to speak at this time Correct. but my hand is still raised <laughs> okay thank you mayor there doesn't appear to be any additional speakers hey i'm going to bring it back to close public comment and bring it back to to council and uh, the the um comments now <laughs> whether they're a question or a comment um does anybody want to take the first swipe madam mayor uh, this is city attorney if i may i noted that a hand went up just as you were closing the public comments i believe it's melissa again uh it appears to be a different name no it is all right if i if i was too um fast then let's take this one public comment All right, for Lawrence, FR Lawrence. Person, okay. 
to, I'm not sure if I'll have the opportunity at this time to raise a question in regards to the Planned Parenthood discussion. No, no that was too late. That's over with, sorry. But there, there was no opportunity for public comment when we were yes. going. Yes, there was, sorry. Oh, oh I see, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we also have Claire Kelly. If there's anybody that would like to speak on the item of the resolution of adopting Rethinking Mobility, a transportation strategic plan, raise your hand now and I am going to count to 10 to give you a sufficient time to do this. If not, I am going to reclose the public comment related to this. Wow. Wow. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks. The problem is that you closed off the public comments at right after, so no one had an opportunity to discuss what the interim chief was saying. And you closed off the, the public comments very quickly. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but it, it just, it lacks transparency. And I know, um, So uh, I will say, uh, Councilman Welk, I, I very much appreciated your suggestion about the ordinance. Um, I know you're about to cut me off, but I thought that was really important given um, the fact that we may have more armed people coming to our city. Um, sure. it's a, yeah, sure. I appreciate sure, you're gonna it. cut me off. Yep, you're gonna cut me off. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Mayor? Yes, Mayor. Could we have the city attorney explain how under state law, our transparency laws require that we cannot have public, what happened with the Planned Parenthood and why we did not go back for more public comment on an item that was not agendized. So um, thank you, council member and, and mayor and council. The council did accept public comments on items not on the agenda and in fact, the mayor um, extended that uh, um, when she and I noticed that others had raised their hand when she was closing it off. So she actually closed that comment period twice. The comments by uh, uh, Interim Chief Hill and the city manager were in response to council inquiries. Um, members of the public are free to speak at the next council meeting again under public comments, but the council did take public comments tonight and the council members comments about the fact that the council is not supposed to take action on items that are not on the agenda is correct. That's why the council is not taking action. The mayor pro tem's comment about potentially having an ordinance come before the council was simply a request by the mayor pro tem. It wasn't an action item of the council this evening. And so the, the city has allowed everyone an opportunity to have public comments during this meeting. Some folks opted uh, for whatever reasons, their own reasons to place their hands up after the public comment uh, time period had closed, but that doesn't obligate the council to reopen public comments again. Thank you. Um, I see that we have two hands. I believe that the city attorney has explained um, why it's not because I'm mean and I don't want to hear what people have to say. It's because we operate under certain rules and the city attorney did an excellent job explaining what the rules are that we have. And the rules are that right now we can only take public comment on the consideration of resolution adopting rethinking mobility a transportation strategic plan. I, I am reluctant to open any, invite anybody else in because it looks like people who are not going to do that. Um, I, Mayor, I, I, if, if I may, I apologize for interrupting. No, nope, I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's, it is um, appropriate for the council to ask the two speakers uh, when you let them in, are they speaking on this item related to the to the transportation plan? If they are, then the council can elect to hear them. If they are not, then 
they should not be allowed to continue to speak because they would be speaking off the topic that is before you right now. But we don't know that unless we give them the opportunity to do that. I believe the speaker, I, Melissa, has tried to speak already, but. Yes. Right. City clerk, will you, um, and, and I am going to close the public comment after we attempt to dis attempt, we attempt to find out what these potential speakers are talking about. So, um, City Clerk, would you please call one of the two people who are still eligible? We have Karen Perkins. Some of, some of the people who might not be too intrigued by autonomous vehicles may be all the bus drivers who will be joining the unemployment lines. And also you might not like the lawsuits when one of these vehicles runs over a bicyclist as once happened because that bicyclist mother or whoever might want to sue. But other than that, I, I think your whole presentation doesn't take in, and I do appreciate some of the more forward looking ideas I know the, the committee, whatever, has worked hard on this, but I don't think you're really taking into account the, um, you know, the, what may be happening in the future in terms of not going back to business as usual here. I mean, we're going to have an awful lot of empty stores and empty office buildings, and people may not be flooding into Walnut Creek. People are going to be poor. They may not be buying stuff. You know, I think that you need some real innovative solutions that really take into account climate change and how you can start having electrified busings, buses and shuttles that you can keep the downtown like it is and put grass in and make it more natural because actually um, crowding everything together there, we don't know how long this COVID-19 is going to go on, but it's going to go on for probably, you know, at least another year, maybe a half year. Who knows? I don't think the vaccine is going to solve it all instantaneously. And besides, it would be nicer to have a downtown without all the parking difficulties of finding parking. I don't know how much money you get. Most of the parking lots, I think, are private. I don't think it all goes to the city. I may be wrong. But, but, um, but if I'm wrong, you've got to start making some difficult choices now. You know, you've got to start thinking about people and about climate change. We just went through a lot of wildfires, a lot of toxic, very toxic smoke. People won't be shopping when the toxic smoke comes in. That might be a few months worth of business that's not gonna be around. Just things like that. Thank you, Karen. And that was in fact specifically on topic. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. And we have Melissa, we did bring in, but um, I'll try again. Yeah, so I'll speak on the topic. Um, earlier, you guys were discussing plans and someone mentioned something about your constituents' attitudes about it. Um, and I really want to back what Karen is saying for you guys to be thinking about climate change and the, what the people need, what we all need. Um, and that you, you all should be evaluating your attitudes towards it. Um, as this is a big decision, it impacts all of us. Now, having said that, in response to what you guys said after my comment, um, I raised my hand during the public comment section when things were uh, off the agenda. So just to make that clear, it's even I'm even verbally denied, um, and, and you can go back and, and view it. <clears throat> so... You know, I, I would like the approval to speak for my two minutes. Um, I don't understand why I was denied since I rose my hand at the right time. Mayor, I, I don't have a problem listening to Melissa. Kevin. Kevin. It's, Thank I mean, you, it, Kevin. 
it's just it's confusing. I, I will just say that it's confusing sometimes when people are raising their hands at times that maybe they're watching on TV or somewhere else and then coming online. I understand the confusion behind this. And I just want to make sure that everybody gets their fair share of being able to speak if they're able to. And if we can correct an oversight, I don't have an issue with that. It's your call, Mayor. It's your call. But I don't have an issue with that. Mayor, if I may ad address the council, um, just so the record is clear, uh, the council had already closed the public comments before Melissa raised her hand. Uh, it's very evident on the video. The council does, as the council will recall, in the handbook, you have the opportunity to take public comments again at the end of the meeting. If, if you wish to do that, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that you take the comment now because you're in the middle of an item on a different issue. And so if the council wishes to hear any further public comments um, under your handbook, you do have the opportunity to take that up at the end of the meeting as you've already taken public comments at the beginning of the meeting. You're not obligated to do that, but you have that opportunity. Thank you. Um, let's stay on topic right now and get the adopting rethinking mobility a transportation strategy dealt with and then we have another item um, which is the county the council's priorities update um, after that and then at that time um, i think um, we, we can talk about whether we should take additional public comment so back to where we were. Um, where, oh shoot. Um, um, I'm gonna see on the damn thing. Um, it doesn't work. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say that I'm going to put on fold, and and then um, would somebody else ask for comments? Please, council member. Um, I'd like to ask a question of just how we could structure this because I have comments in categories like the commute trips, which is the four strategies, and then the transit. There were schools. There were four categories, and I can't remember what the four categories are off the top of my head. But maybe we could just group our comments and any additional questions by those categories so that because if we all go independently here, we may, we'll be all over the map, which may not be helpful to um, staff and the consultant in terms of just tracking the few comments we might have. Which, by the way, I think this is a great start, and I think it does reflect what the community wants us to look at, albeit it was nine months ago they, would, they were interested in how we can reduce congestion and uh, improve efficiency of transportation and things like that. But I think this is really moving in the right direction. So anyway, that was my suggestion. And in the meantime, while I tap danced a little bit, Mayor, your phone stopped making that funny noise. <laughs> that embarrassing. Um, yeah, um, so I've, I've heard you say that we should do um, the, the four strategy, the four groups of, of stuff. I agree with you, except I, one of my comments on the strategies was um, they, they fall into more than one category. So for example, item strategy five, which is bicycle amenities, um, also goes under under the commute trips. So um, I think we're gonna do a little bouncing around anyhow, uh, but let's stick with, stick with that. So let's do, is your suggestion that we do um, strategies one through four first, council member Sella? That would be my suggestion, at least as a way to break it up and try to keep us on target for, for staff and the consulting team. Hey, if the rest of the council agrees, I'm fine with that. Shake heads, head shaking. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to go first? Please. Okay. Um, on the TDM reporting in the first strategy, I think this is incredibly important and we need to start even structuring how we would ask the questions and coming up with an online system is going to take time. So even while people are not yet back to work, I think it's important that we get this started. And I think I'm gonna jump down to commute alternatives. We need to be the pilot 
internally for how the system would work and how the an online tool would get the answers to the questions. And I also think you can ask the questions of people and employers to ask the questions of their employees, even if they're working from home, they do know where they, how they got to work be pre-COVID. It may change later, but we, you, at least you get a baseline. Um, I think it's also important that we figure out a way to incentivize employers that are in these four employee employment centers in Walnut Creek and figure out a way to make it mandatory, but with a carrot to be part of that because John Muir, Kaiser, and some of the big employers in Shadelands and the big employers in the Golden Triangle are really important to understand how, where their people are coming from and, and their mode and their origin and, des and their origin. And um, I think it's critical for any success of any of these strategies is to really know that data and to have a baseline. Um, and then I had a technical question and maybe, um, I'm not sure who will know the answer. Are we allowed to ask, for example, if the Golden Triangle is an employment center, maybe no employer in there is big enough to be the only one we ask, but can we just look at it as a single employer in all those office buildings and ask it of all of them. I think that's the way Bishop Ranch would work, for example, or Hacienda Business Park, where you don't really care that it's one employer, you just want 10% of all the employees that are in those sections to be able to answer those questions. And I think Shadelands Business Park might be the same way, if technically we could do it that way. Um, so that's my comments on the first one. On the BART trips, I think it's the same thing. It's so specific. It, knowing origin and destination are critical to knowing who should get a BART incentive pass and what and where we'll move, how we'll move the needle. On infrastructure, same comment. You can't pick a pilot corridor unless you know origin and destination and where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And um, I think the commute alternatives is really good we need to do it and we need to, to get that data as a baseline and a test for how we would get that data. And those are my comments on the first four. Hey, anybody want to join on the first four? Pile on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Matt, did I see a hand? Yes, and I, um, let's see, I think Cindy or council member Silva is, is absolutely correct that looking at the TDM uh, more holistically, like the Shadelands Park as a whole, makes a lot of sense to me. And and uh, I'm not sure how it would work in the, in the Golden Triangle or downtown because it's a little more disparate, but I think that is the right approach. And especially given that, as far as I know, I think John Muir is the only one that has an adopted TDM plan that we know of. I'm sure Kaiser and some of the other employers do it just as a matter of a good policy and course, but ones that we're aware of or that we've conditioned the projects on, John Muir is, is the only one. So I think thinking that way makes a lot of sense. And and uh, I also agree on the, the comment on the, the data and where people are coming from and going to in order to incentivize them to take BART to Walnut Creek or to take um, transit. I will applaud ourselves and pat ourselves on the back we're going all electric on the downtown trolley, which has been at least four years now, that that's been all electric. And I think to the extent we can extend those types of programs to other shuttle services, that is the wave of the future. So we are not only reducing BMTs, but reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, and just a more macro comment on this is that, and it, and it goes back to another thing Council Member Silva said on the ABAG numbers, that the more jobs we have in Walnut Creek, the less people have to commute out of Walnut Creek generally. And I think putting the emphasis and the approach on, on creating good high paying jobs in Walnut Creek, both in the Shadelands and downtown, reduces the amount of, of, of time people spend in the car away from their family and commuting to and from work. Obviously, the more convenient you make it for someone to take transit, the more likely they're gonna do it. And, and that's why it happens in more urban centers, but it can happen in suburban areas as well. So let's see, I think on the commute, oh, 
alternative program. My only somewhat of a concern is I'd want to, I certainly want to give incentives to our employees to take uh, transit and BART. But if that's not feasible for them, I don't want to punish them either if they have to drive and park in one of our garages. So I think there's a balance there that we should incentivize as much as we can and make it as convenient as possible. But again, if they're coming from a location where it doesn't make sense, if it's gonna be a two hour trip for them just to get to work, I, I don't think any of us wanna see that happen. So I wanna be flexible in terms of, of how that gets implemented. Anybody else? I don't see any others. Uh, um, I, I appreciate both of my um, fellow council members. Um, I, I commuted for a long time and the thought of getting on 20 different vehicles to get um, to be responsible and not get in my car um, just curls my toes. So I think we do have to be flexible and responsible. And, and it isn't easy to change culture. And um, if, there's, if there is a culture that really needs to be changed, it's to get people out of their cars and think of different ways to get from here to there. Um, so I like the idea that we're going to remain nimble and that we're going to incorporate a lot of the things that we have to deal with um, up to and including the fact that art no, may not run on Sundays or Saturdays and only small hours. Um, so um, it, it's kind of scary that in five years, we're gonna know so much more in, at, at the end of the trail about what we would do. And even as I read this, I realized I knew in this last year, I know a lot more about transportation than I did even, even when it was first presented. So um, I, I, I didn't see, and I'd like somebody to assure me that in this is a lot of flexibility that we haven't laid out a plan so tight that we don't, we don't get to drop something and take something out when it's clear that it should be adjusted. Somebody can shake a head. Yeah, we, we've got enough flexibility. And can Thank be you. amended if the council desired to amend it. And there is a lot of flexibility already in the way that the plan is written. Okay. The council, if you were considering um, adopting it tonight, um, consistent with the staff recommendation, you could also direct staff to consider the further direction that's been provided by some council members this evening and either come back with an amendment or implementation measures that effectuate the comments that were made by um, uh, council members Silva and, and Francois. Thank you. And if I may, um, sorry, yes. just oh. the strategic planning effort uh, and just like many of our strategic planning efforts have to be nimble. This provides us at least with a roadmap that cements our future, but just like this last year, we we have to be nimble. Um, so so yes to to your comment, Mayor. Thank you. Um, are we still on the trail? Um, bicycles of items five through seven. Councilmember Silva. I'll pick up at that last conversation. As I made a note when we were um, during one portion of the pre of the presentation, that perhaps what we really need to do is let you move. We adopt it tonight. We move so it can move forward. You begin working on the immediate things and come back in June and tell us where you think we are because we're going to know so much about the environment we're in, so much more. Plus, you'll be able to tell us, hey, this is how we're going to find out where our own employees, um, how they get here and where they come from. Um, so uh, bicycle amenities, a couple of quick FYI comments. I appreciate the concept of that bike racks can be public art, but you might want to talk to the um, Arts and Recreation Department about the public art ordinance. And I think it needs to be referenced in some future because this implies that it could just happen and someone's going to come in and request that, or I'll just do art in the bike racks. And right now I don't believe bike racks are eligible for public art. And then um, there's been a couple of references to the Recycle Smart funds. And unfortunately, those funds came from the sale of recyclables. And that era is over. And so we will no longer be accruing funds. And um, so I can't promise, I, I wouldn't bank on those as a 
recurring um, availability. Uh, we, Council Member Francois and I just had a meeting on rates and the reserve funds last week. Um, in terms of um, innovative mobility, I really appreciate that we don't really know where the scooters are yet, but we were successful in the um, bill at the state legislature and Governor Newsom signed it that basically gives us some control over them coming into our community. So hopefully the Transportation Commission will be prepared to work with you all on that. And I like the idea that there would be a pilot of a um, kind of like this car sharing TNC to key destinations and a, a pilot, what I call destination and origin, for example, Walnut Creek Park to Joan Near Health or Walnut Creek Park to Shadelands Business Park. Notice I'm just trying to get down to those lovely employment centers that you talked about. And um, then regarding trails, I'm a little confused because East Bay Parks does not own many of those other trails. Contra Costa Water District owns the key east-west trails that we need. Those east-west trails also connect Shadelands Business Park, the Ignacio Valley with Shadelands Business Park and John Muir Health. So I actually think we need to correct some of the phrasing and the titles of these because it's not just the East Bay Park District. It's also two water districts that have trails in our community. And the Iron Horse Trail is actually probably in the best shape in comparison to the Contra Costa Water District, the Canal Trail. But the Canal Trail actually is longer and it is the one trail that you could use to get from um, Boundary Oak Golf Course all the way to downtown. And so I think we need to be cognizant of that when we talk about those trails. Council members, I just wanted a, a little point of clarification. Um, East Bay Regional Parks Districts uh, actually- Am I wrong? <laughs> No, they just, they operate the trail um, and they maintain it. Um, the, the ownership varies for pretty much all the trails in Walnut Creek, kind of depending on, on the location. Okay, so we only have to work with East Bay Parks? For the purpose of this, of a plan in, in, this, in this case, uh, yeah, they would be the, the people we would be uh, reaching out to. Um, just only, again, specifically for the, for the recommendations in this plan. But not necessarily for any capital improvements that would need to occur for widening of trails or improving of those trails, then it would have to be the two water districts depending on which trail it was. Yeah, under those circumstances, we would be bringing in other, uh, other uh, stakeholders. Okay, so maybe that just needs to be footnoted in case we all disappear. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Are you? Oh, I, I didn't know who the thank you was for, sorry. Um, any other comments? Oh, Matt, Council oh, Member I, Francois. You can call me Matt. That's, uh, I know, but I'm trying to be proper. I, um, in terms of the bicycle amenities, I, and I, it goes with the innovative mobility programs, I think, I, I really see the future as being Kind of these shuttle services whether they're provided by the employers or whether they're kind of more of an uber lift model that are more carpooling in nature or e-bikes maybe someone will take i know we're talking about non-commute but it, the bike fits into commute too i think if someone is going if i was going from my home in park mead to walnut creek bard i would seriously think taking an e-bike e i could take a regular bike too i know but an e-bike would be more fun um from my house to Walnut Creek and know that I'd have a, a bike at the BART station and know I'd have a bike locker there to lock it up. So I think focusing maybe our energy on that for certain types of trips and then for the downtown core, maybe it is maybe it is more of a, a scooter type uh, device where people go, you know, go from place to place downtown. So um, we also know, you know, the transit village is still being constructed and I recall at one point many moons ago when I was on the planning commission that there was supposed to be kind of a bike facility as part of that project and sort of a repair station and a place kind of a, a dedicated kind of place to, to park your bike more than a bike locker. And I, 
and so hopefully things like that are still being worked on. And um, let's see. I agree with the trails. I think they are, you know, especially for Ignacio Valley, getting people, you know, they're, they're traveling on Ignacio Valley Road itself is not a viable option. So getting people on the trails and coordinating with our regional partners on that will be key. Uh, and in terms of, of expanding even, and I, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but I could see there being the option for additional bike lockers and facilities in our garages. If we're really successful in changing people's habits and mindset, which I hope we are, and it's a total habit thing. Once you start commuting a different way, you get used to it and it just feels right to do it that way, that we could have, you know, repurpose some of the space in the garage, not all of it, or maybe even not a lot of it, but some of it for kind of more bi bicycle um, amenities. Can I ask a question of staff? Sure. You just asked a question, but you can ask another one. When we thought about locations for bike repair stations, did we ever think about partnering with the um, service stations that are in strategic locations, particularly in downtown and along Ignacio Valley Road? They, ha they already have the air for tires and they have space. It might be, I know we, really don't want people gassing up their vehicles, but in the uh, anticipation that they don't disappear too soon, perhaps that is, um, those are strategic locations where it might work. Okay, so my question is, um, what do we do when it's rainy and windy? Um, do, we, do we do in all the parking spaces so that um, everybody has to have, wear sou'westers and, and um, ride their bike. I mean, there are times when it is just too inclement to ride a bicycle. And then another sub question, there are people who righteously are afraid of riding bicycles. They have fragile bones or conditions like that. Um, do, do, you know, how do, how do we blend the acceptance between making bicycles look like the only thing we should do and, and, and recognizing there are just times when we bicycles aren't the right vehicle at all. Great question, Mayor. I just, I'll just quickly note that, you know, part of what TDM speaks to is that it's, it's finding the right mode for that trip. So while it may be a trip to the BART station, it could also be a trip to the grocery store that you're picking up a lot of groceries. So it's not that every trip has to be done by a bicycle or other active mobility. It's that those trips, for example, what we understand nationwide is that about a quarter to a third of trips are under two miles. So it may just be an idea of which type of trips um, are done uh, on a bike or active mobility. And honestly, car trips, um, we understand will still happen. Um, it's just a matter of, of shifting some of the other trips as well. Thank you. All right. I'm thinking we've finished with five through seven, eight and nine. Any comments on eight? Oh, yes. Why don't you start, Council Member Silva? So thank you very much um, on this category. I, I like the idea of the task force with um, parent groups. I think one way we could encourage people to talk to us and work with us is to tie the incentive of our crossing guard funds with um, people working with us and having, you know, you have, to, you have to participate with us and come up with solutions. I also caution that we shouldn't abandon what CCTA, Transpac, and 511 Contra Costa are doing because um, unlike some of the other cities in, the, in Contra Costa, we have five different school districts in Walnut Creek. And one of the, and the biggest school district, the Mount Diablo School District, is not just in Walnut Creek, it is in other cities. So if we are not working at a regional level the way we can through Transpac, we don't get very, we can't get very innovative with that very large district. So we have to be mindful of the relationships and um, the, 
the original crossing guard services that we came up with 11 years ago was because we were working across the communities at TransPAC on that. That's where it started. Thank you. Oh, the okay. other one, school transit. Um, I think before we, first of all, I have a question. Is the county connection bus no longer, okay, right now it's not. But ordinarily for school to, um, and the w, for WCI, there's county connection buses that the middle school kids can take, can ride to WCI and home. Is that no longer working in a non-COVID environment? So last year in February, I think I was still seeing the buses on the roads. Is that correct? I will uh, defer to Andy on the county connection question, but I believe they also just recently started a pilot specifically targeting school uh, uh, students. Uh, well, that, that bus program has been running for years. I mean, sorry, a free, um, a free or reduced price for students. Pilot. Yes, uh, Councilmember Silva, I can answer that question. That, that at, though they're not operating because the schools aren't physically opening, are, aren't physically open at the moment, the 600 series school tripper routes are still, you know, on the books, so to speak. And okay. I haven't heard anything about them being repealed. Okay, great. And and then to follow up with what Ozzy had added is that the County Connection is actually considering uh, revising their fare structure to include a uh, reduced uh, reduced cost youth rates, which would hopefully uh, help uh, with uh, increasing ridership, not only on those lines, but on some of the standard routes that serve schools. Um, and then I think before we get really excited about what Law Marinda has done with the school bus program there, I think we need to understand why they do that and why kids don't walk or ride a bike to school in those communities. It's not because they're higher end communities, but they have a lot of very narrow, very hilly roads with no infrastructure to, that would make it safe. So I believe that the school bus program was their alternative to safe routes to school. And they have nothing, they don't have a lot of everything else, but um, perhaps the mayor would know from her work on CCTA, what they talk about, but I think we need to understand it. They also have fewer school districts involved. Each of those three communities has one elementary district and then a single high school district. We have more school districts involved in, in Walnut Creek than they all have across three communities. So we just need to understand the differences before we get overly excited. And the cost. Hey. I'm watching to see if anybody wants to make any more comments. Yes, Council Member Francois. So just to add on that, I think one element that would be nice to see in the plan, and one thing that I've experienced through our work with Recycle Smart Board, is we have a bunch of competitive students and parents. So when it comes to diverting uh, materials out of the landfill, the schools get a, a waste buster award if they achieve like an 80% diversion rate. And several of our elementary schools have done that. So I think this is tailor-made to, to reduction in BMT. Let's have a competition among the schools in Walnut Creek. Who can achieve the greatest reduction in BMT? The bus to WCI is an absolute godsend. And uh, it should never be discontinued, in my opinion. It saves parents a lot of heartache and grief. Um, and at least an hour each way commuting back and forth. And I think the trick, and I think Cindy made a good point about how La Miranda is different given the topography and the distance between where people live and go to school. But I, I think there's an opportunity there for the elementary schools to really increase walking. And if it's, if we get in, you know, if we make this competitive, if they get their steps in and they can track that, and we recognize them, you know, at an annual awards thing at the city. I think that's absolutely something we should do. It starts young. It, get the mindset started at the right time. And then that'll just be a habit for these kids for the rest of their lives. Um, I'm moving now on to 10 through 13. Council Member Silva, I'm going to let you start first. Well, I'm really pleased that we've made so much progress in these three areas. Uh, nothing like a good crisis to make, <laughs> make good things come about. 
Um, a couple of comments. I think um, the taking advantage of the state grant and reassessing our parking requirement for new development is imperative now with these RENA numbers that are about to come down the pike. Because in order to get those RENA numbers, in order to get a little more density, we need to reduce the amount of under underutilized parking spaces that are being built into the buildings. I think about the Brio and how they intentionally overparked it. And then they now don't, don't really know what to do with all that excess parking capacity. I think they probably could lease it to some car dealerships for inventory, but they, it isn't housing and we're gonna need the housing. Um, I have a question for Carla. What do you define as in terms of, we now have two on-street zones, what do you define as the mid zone? And I wrote a question, would it be locust from civic to target? Would that be the mid zone? Or um, have I missed, misinterpreted what you might be, what you might mean? So I think um, as we were writing this plan a year ago, we had an idea. Um, as we were watching demand patterns change downtown with everything going on, um, I don't have a definitive answer on streets just yet and different blocks of what areas would be a mid zone. Um, I think we would, we're going to have to wait and see as we start to come out of um, COVID and, our, and we move through the, the state's tiers. I think we're going to see a different demand pattern and we're, we can assess then. Okay. And I'll just, sorry, I'll add to that. Uh, we now have these on-street parking sensors available. And so we can collect that data once, okay. um, you know, as we give it a little time, we'll be able to really be able to uh, hone in and determine block by block what would be appropriate. So it's just outside the pedestrian retail district, but not all the way to Walden Road, which is still in the core, but um, <laughs> okay. And, um, I think we have to really be mindful and I appreciate that the plan is mindful of what we need to do to ensure we're providing appropriate employee parking and accommodating that. So the employees have places to park, but you're, yet they're not consuming spaces that customers would need. And I would just make a, a note. This is one place where um, I love the case study of the Melinda and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, that is a, the, high the new high-tech district in downtown Seattle. And so it is surrounded by high-tech high-rises. I just saw it over the weekend and my daughter went, oh, that's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I went, oh, I just read about that. And so I, I think we have to be mindful that case studies are sometimes not context necessarily the same as what we have here in Walnut Creek, as much as we might like to have a 1200 employer um, location they are downtown. They're in, well, they're in South Union, but uh, so thank you. You're mute, Mayor. Uh, anything from anybody else? So I just had two quick comments on, on the parking sensors. Smadar, thank you for mentioning those. And Carla for informing me that we have something like over 1200 sensors downtown, which is just gonna be a treasure trove of information. So I'm glad to hear that that's gonna factor into the implementation of this plan. On the right sizing of parking, I know that study is underway and I appreciate staff being uh, proactive in terms of searching out funds for that study, just like they found funds for this study. Um, I'd really like to see us on that get to the point where we right size the number, whatever that number is, and we allow the residential developer to meet that number however they want to, through lifts, through tandem parking, through valet. However, they let's not micromanage that decision. If anything, I think our attendant parking program in the city garage shows that it can be done successfully outside of the box, and we should allow that the private sector to be able to take advantage of that too. Thank you. Okay, um, I have nothing more to say. I'm not seeing anybody having anything more to say. We have an action request. 
Mayor, so, I'm sorry, I have one more comment, and I know that we all share this, but Ozzy, I want to thank you personally please. for your dedication, for your passion, for your commitment to this project. Uh, it's been a success largely because of you and with our partner, Fair and Pierce and Kari. So thank you for seeing this through. I know it was a long haul and you kind of got caught midstream on it, but it was very successful and congratulations. And we all, we all thank you for that. Thank you, Matt. I would say ditto. And um, for a guy that grew up in winters, I got it right, right? <laughs> I mean, is there even a bus in winters? <laughs> there is a local shuttle. There is. <laughs> Yellow County, no. The buckhorn, I know that. <laughs> well, I appreciate the comments um, and I would be remiss if I said that it wasn't a team effort here. As you can tell, there's a lot of staff that work on transportation and mobility in the city. Um, so I just wanna thank them and really thank you council and commissioners uh, for being a part of this effort. I'll say it, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, council member Silva. I have a question for um, the city attorney. If I wanted to move the adoption of the resolution, but add in that st staff would circle back and give us an update no later than June 2021 so that we see where what's happening in the environment and the progress on the early, the very near term um, action steps, where would I put that, Steve? So you could you could actually just um, entertain a motion to adopt the resolution as it's proposed, and then also to provide direction to staff to report back in June 2021 on the issues that you've identified. Can so I do it in one motion? Pardon? May I do it in one motion or do I need to do it in no, two? I can be in one motion. All right, so I move the adoption of the resolution of the City Council of the City of Walnut Creek in order to adopt the Rethinking Mobility, a transportation strategic plan. And in addition, direct staff to report back to us no later than June, 2021 on how the plan is looking given the um, COVID environment and what has been learned in the early stages of the first plan steps. Second. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote please? Councilmember Silva? Aye. Councilmember Francois? Aye. Councilmember Waddell? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Will? Aye. Mayor Haskew? Aye. All right, that puts this one to bed um, and the same process is going to happen for um, the City Council 2019-2020 priorities update. And um, I believe there's a staff report and um, I see Carla is likely to be the candidate. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, members of the public. I'm rounding out your evening with the 2019-2020 City Council priorities update. And I am waiting for the presentation to pop up. Okay, I will get started and we'll wait for the, the slides to come on. Um, the item before you is, uh, thank you. The item before you is an update on the priorities that you all set in February, 2019. And staff's goal is really to update you on these priorities um, on a quarterly basis. And the last update that we provided to you was February, 2020. The theme of this presentation is and then COVID happened. Um, you're gonna hear me say that a lot this evening. Um, I think we're all used to hearing that, but it is very apparent um, as we go through each one of these priorities. The action for you this evening on this item is to receive the report. Um, you know, as we, so we updated you in February um, and then COVID happened. Uh, we shifted focus. Um, on a number of things, uh, responding to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, responding to the fiscal year 20 deficit, responding and building a budget um, and closing a $12 million deficit. And then really hearing from the public and working with the community to address mental health services, social and racial justice over the last six months. 
So while we were doing all of that, uh, we were still making progress on these four priorities. And I'm gonna go through each one. And we do have subject matter experts on deck to answer questions for you at the end of the presentation. So next slide, please. So economic development, uh, this, this priority really stems from um, the adopted 2019 economic development strategic plan. And the focus uh, for the work plan in 2020 was to implement the first set of strategies in version 2.0 of the Blueprint for Services Action Phase 1, to establish a core set of relevant economic indicators and performance analytics, and to create a toolkit for business retention in collaboration with local partners and to develop a retail strategy. The implementation of the, the economic development strategic plan was heavily uh, impacted by the COVID crisis as the team that worked in economic development is, is in addition to people throughout the city, um, their time was shifted to the rebound program um, that you all have heard a lot about tonight. Next slide, please. Next, thank you. Uh, so to update you on the three, um, the three first uh, work plan items in phase one. Um, so the economic indicators, staff has identified relevant indicators and uh, performance analytics and began working on a shareable dashboard. This work was put on pause um, as of uh, because of COVID, um, but really we're looking forward to resuming this work because we have so many lessons learned from the rebound program that we can incorporate into developing these analytics and performance indicators. As far as the toolkit for business retention, staff imp implemented a technology to enhance communications between the city and businesses. Um, that technology is called Blue Dot, and it provides a customer relationship management platform for both internal and external communications um, with a focus on business retention. Um, it's a web-based platform, um, and it gives internal departments uh, like community development, business license, public works, a single shared view and a way to track communications between all of our businesses to make sure that we are actively engaging with our businesses on a regular basis. This tool came in handy during the beginning of COVID-19. Um, it was modified to allow um, businesses to post if they were open for takeout and delivery um, and for customers to search for open businesses. Um, and we are currently updating this uh, technology to um, classify businesses by industry for better tracking and industry development. And lastly, the retail strategy. Um, you know, it's with everything going on with COVID, it really is unclear what the retail landscape is going to look like. Uh, we are anticipating higher retail vacancies. Um, we're in the beginning stages of developing a retail strategy um, that will examine existing and planned retail square footage. Um, and a retention and attraction plan will also be developed uh, with that analysis. And really when all of this dust settles, um, we will be re-looking at the economic development strate strategic plan um, to reevaluate and see what is still relevant and what's, what needs to be updated. Next slide, please. So Blueprint Service Action for Success, better known as Blueprint Version 2, um, was as of, we made a lot of progress on this, um, this item uh, before 2020. And as of March uh, 2020 this year, we had about 80% of phase one complete. Um, and phase one is really focused on enhancing and updating our design review process to make it easier to use, easier clear to understand, um, updating our permitting process. So having a check, checklist for site development, online permit submittal, um, and enhancing our customer service uh, for both online for permitting and also at our permit counter. Um, so staff has done a lot of work on this um, and still, uh, still has work to do. Again, this, this cross-departmental team that works on Blueprint also shifted their focus and worked heavily in the rebound um, on the rebound program and has been, which has made that program very successful. Again, lessons learned from working with um, being, being forced to be very nimble with permitting and responding to business need very 
quickly will provide um, good lessons learned for um, the ongoing uh, progress made on Blueprint. Next slide, please. So really the goal for the Environmental Sustainability and Com Climate Action Plan priority was to update the city's climate action plan um, to include sustainability priorities for the next 10 years um, that are targeted at re reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, since the, the last priorities update in February, staff has completed work on phase one, which was uh, project initiation and vis visioning. Um, this also includes a lot of public outreach, which um, shifted to all virtual outreach uh, due to COVID-19. And the summary of both the technical documents that were developed uh, in phase one as, and the uh, summary of all the community outreach will be provided to council at a meeting um, soon. And the next phase is really focusing on setting goals for greenhouse uh, gas, <laughs> excuse me, greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, for years 2030 and 2050. Um, and then prioritizing uh, sustainability and climate change adaptation and resilience strategies. Um, so this work's really gonna be focused on in winter and spring 21. And then looking ahead to phase three, which is focused in um, summer 2021, will be actual plan preparation and um, environmental review of the document. Next slide, please. Fiscal sustainability. Um, we were in the full swing of budget development in February when we last updated you on this priority. Um, and we were focused on really five things. And that was conducting outreach and soliciting feedback from the community to see what they what they were, what their budget priorities were and at what service levels. And working with staff to analyze our operations and see if we could find some ways to um, create efficiencies. In addition, we were looking ahead to completing a comprehensive fee study and identifying revenue opportunities. And then COVID happens. Um, really the pandemic had a shift focus immediately to um, solving the economic um, crisis that uh, came with the pandemic for our 20 fiscal year 20 budget. Um, and the next slide, please. The next slide really shows how fast things changed and how much work had to be done in a very short amount of time. So in February 2020, um, the city council contributed 3.9 million to the workers' comp and facilities reserve, reserves. March, pre-COVID, um, the finance committee heard an update from our finance team and we are projecting a $3 million general fund surplus um, due to stronger sales tax activity and um, property tax growth. Um, and then COVID happened and the, in the same month. And we were looking, we were staring down at a, um, at a $10 million deficit. Um, and that was April that we worked together with uh, staff, with finance committee and council to close that uh, $10 million gap using um, both one-time reductions and uh, approval of use of $3.6 million in reserves. Um, immediately after closing that budget gap, we had to shift focus on the fiscal year 21 budget development, and, which we were looking at a $12 million uh, deficit for the entire fiscal year. And in order to really look at long-term health of the city's finances, um, we reduced, infrastructure funding, operating uh, funding, contributions to outside organizations, including additional funding for library hours. Um, we made some tough decisions on personnel um, and got approval to use up to $2.3 million in reserves. Again, this is for fiscal year 21, and we're able to close that gap um, and adopt a budget on July 7th um, of this year. So this, um, I think this, this slide shows, and you all remember this, that this was a, a very tough effort. And also um, we, were, we were doing this all while um, completely shifting how we were doing our budget. So we were um, shifting from a biannual budget update to quarterly updates 
Um, we are increasing the level of analysis um, and, uh, and reporting to all of you in the community about what was going on with our budget. Um, this will continue as we develop the 2022 and 2023 budgets. Um, and staff is, again, um, still holding on to the, the plans that we had uh, way back in 2019. We are planning to complete a comprehensive fee study for general services in summer 2021. Next slide, please. Moving on to infrastructure and facilities. Uh, this priority is really twofold. It's looking at our capital investment program um, to make sure that we're planning ahead um, for the long-term health of our infrastructure for our city, and also looking at um, the critical infrastructure needs at four facilities, including Civic Park Community Center, Heather Farm Park, Shadelands Arts Center, and Clark Swim Center. Next slide, please. So the city develops a 10-year capital investment program um, as a planning tool to prioritize capital needs long-term. Um, and this is usually done in conjunction with a two-year capital budget. And the infrastructure in this plan is everything from streets to sidewalks to storm drains, traffic signals, buildings. Um, we plan for what, we, what the city is going to need and when these um, infrastructure pieces need to be replaced. Um, the last uh, capital investment program was adopted in uh, 2017, October 2017. Uh, because we did a one-year budget for fiscal year 2021, we also adopted a capital budget, a one-year capital budget um, for 2021. And we are planning to uh, begin the process to, to develop a full 10-year uh, CIP um, in conjunction with a two-year capital budget beginning in November of this year. Next slide, please. And the Your Park Share Future side of this uh, priority is really, this initiative began back in spring 2018. And uh, we were looking at two phases to this project. The first phase was really looking at arts and rec uh, programming and future facilities planning. Um, and then phase two was uh, parks master planning for Heather Farm Park and Civic Park. Um, and this is really a 10 year vision and design for those plans. Next slide, please. We made significant progress on phase one, uh, particularly in, with community engagement. Um, I won't list out all of the types of community engagement that we did, but um, I can tell you it was a lot and helped inform the plan. Um, phase one concluded in February, 2020 um, with direction from council on the future of facilities and on the slide here, um, the decisions that were made um, were to really focus on Heather Farm and Clark Swim Center, uh, maintain existing preschool spaces, um, eliminate assembly hall and um, move industrial arts to Shadelands, um, putting a pause on the assembly room to be uh, planned at, at a future Heather Farm community center, and um, no decision was made regarding the size of a lap pool at Clark Swim Center. Next slide, please. And phase two is really focused on master planning um, outdoor spaces at Heather Farm and Civic Park. Um, this was put on hold in June due to everything that we were dealing with, with current health and um, economic crises um, and the impacts to the city's budget at that point. Um, however, phase two can be considered in the next budget cycle um, and a scope of work would need to be revised and refined based on the needs um, at the time when the project restarts. Next slide, please. So before I conclude, I want to make sure um, I am the person presenting this information, but there is a huge, huge team um, behind all of this information and all of this work. And I just want to make sure to recognize and thank the many, many staff that have worked on these priorities over the last two years um, and have been so creative and very nimble um, in getting this work done um, with changes in focus over the last couple of years. Um, as I mentioned, they are all available for questions. Um, and with that, I will conclude the presentation and happy to open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, team. Um, Council Member Silva. Thank you so much, Carla. 
Um, I truly appreciate all the work that everyone has done. First of all, figuring out how to navigate the last seven or eight months. And then the second is trying to figure out how to then get us back on track going forward with all of our priorities. My question is in the fiscal sustainability category and it probably goes to the city manager. How do you envision the two year budget process be it being the same or different? And what do you think some of the, what you had thought, what differences might there be in what you had originally thought pre COVID? Dan Buckshy, city manager. Uh, we do intend to go back to the two year budget. Um, as your council knows, we did a one year budget for one year, primarily in order to align the budget cycle with when we set council priorities. And we always set council, I shouldn't say always, the last several years, council priorities have been set in an odd number year after an election in the event that there is a new council member that they'd have an opportunity to help set priorities as opposed to waiting two years. And then we've set a two year time frame for priorities so that um, uh, it aligns during that two years in which there is not an election. That said, we intend to continue with the two year cycle. Obviously what's become more difficult is forecasting. I mean, trying to predict the future is, is always a risky business. We obviously created the new forecasting model that allows for more additional scenario planning. So that part will be challenging. We do intend to continue on the path that we started down a year ago pre-COVID and that uh, we are adding additional detail into the budget submittals that are provided by departments that help with our internal review. Uh, we're also hoping to uh, refine the level of detail in terms of our revenue forecast to, to better un understand some of the parameters, recognizing especially sales tax is particularly challenging right now with the ups and downs, big shift to online, which is impacting the county pool allocation. So a lot of moving parts. Uh, but what we really intend to do here is um, really start to kick things off, at least at the department level in December, and then we'll be giving an update to council. Obviously, we have a finance committee coming up to talk about our first quarter report in November. We'll have our financial statements that will go to council in December. And then I think we'll really start more in earnest with council on the two-year process after the start of the new year. Thank you. More questions? Uh, Mayor Pertem. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Not sure what was going on there. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Carla. Obviously, there is um, so much that, that you've had to do on this. And of course, all we were dealing with was COVID and all and the economic uh, rebound that we were trying to have. And it was, uh, yeah, a challenge. So it's, I'm glad to see that these priorities have continued to be worked on. I had a couple of questions on the climate action uh, part of it and just wanted to see if you've been able to fold in and I guess, yeah, Kara is probably the one that's uh, more uh, closely aligned with that. If you've been able to fold in some of the discussions that I've been seeing around the community, like for example, uh, we were looking into new technology for gas powered leaf blowers. And I know there's a pilot program that's happening in Rossmore for that. We also talked about single use items like plastic straws. Oh my gosh, probably a year ago at this point. And, uh, and if that's been uh, wrapped into this larger discussion for climate action, like we had talked about, when we first brought this up. Yeah, so um, Kara Batista Rao, Sustainability Coordinator and Housing Analyst. Uh, we did expand the scope from just a climate action plan update to also addressing um, being prepared for the impacts of climate change, so adaptation or resilience, as well as broader sustainability so we could capture the community's concerns and interest in topics like plastic or air quality and leaf blowers. So in this first phase that we just completed, we were um, doing a lot of technical analysis and uh, getting an input from the community on kind of the vision. But the next phase, phase two, um, will be more focused on strategy development and prioritizing those strategies. So I think we can get into some of those um, ideas for what kind of uh, plastic waste reduction or leaf blowers or other um, very specific strategies that the community might be interested in. 
great. I, re- I really appreciate it. I feel like, uh, you know, with priorities, we're juggling four balls. And then uh, with COVID and everything, suddenly a fifth ball was thrown in there. We're still supposed to keep everything up in the air. So I really appreciate all the work that you've been doing on this. Thank you. Other questions? Can I, I ask remember a question? Can I ask Kara a question? I just wanted to. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Make sure I understood. So you're folding these ideas or you're analyzing these ideas as part of phase two, but they will get that analysis will also show us what the impact would be, kind of like the cost benefit analysis of any of those strategies. Yes. So we'll be coming back to council in the future as we begin to kick off phase two. And at that meeting, we'll present the results from phase one. So you kind of know what the community was interested in, what the initial technical analysis said. And then we'll give you um, kind of our proposed approach to phase two in terms of uh, how we would um, share strategies with the community for feedback, what kind of analysis or information would be helpful to gather um, in terms of things like cost, co-benefits, or other criteria that would help you make decisions in the future. So that kind of framework for how to analyze strategies will be presented to council at a future meeting. And that way, when we kick off work on phase two, we'll know what kind of information you're looking for that would help us to prioritize strategies. But we won't not necessarily know if I am understanding your answer. We won't necessarily know the, Im- the potential impacts of any one strategy versus another until after phase two? We, yes, I think at the end of phase two, we'd have that information. Um, We want to both solicit what strategies are of most interest to the community and then do some analysis for what kind of impact they would have. And then in the final phase, as we prepare the plan, we would kind of bundle all that together in terms of strategies that are high impact um, that align with the criteria to help prioritize them. And that would be reviewed by council as part of the review and adoption process. Okay, thank you. Could I, um, if Mayor, if I could, I just wanted to, to add a clarification point to, to make sure if I uh, were on the same page. What I heard was uh, the process is we're gathering input from what the community may be interested in, but we're also going to conduct analyses on those potential options and others to determine what, uh, to put more simply, might be the biggest bang for the duck buck or what might be some trade-offs. So it may not be simply, if I heard correctly, a matter of pursuing the initiative that the community may be interested in if they happen to be a very high cost with a very low reduction in greenhouse gas. Or conversely, you know, there may be some that are just the opposite, that are lower costs that have a high value in terms of greenhouse gas reduction but that we'd be looking at a mix of uh, input from the community as well as research and feedback from other technical experts. Is that an accurate summary, Kara? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and that was what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Mayor, I think her screen is frozen. I had a question, so I'll go ahead until she gets unfrozen. Um, I think it's to you, Dan. Uh, You know, we had adopted these priorities, what, two years ago now almost, and we're coming up on the two-year mark. So what happens at that point? Um, Because we're not completed with all of them yet. And, and then where, where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah. so uh, per the council or per the schedule your council adopted this evening, the plan is that we would do priority setting for calendar years 21 and 22 on March 23rd, if I recall correctly. Um, at least it's in the latter portion of March. Don't quote me on the exact date. We will continue to work on these. We will obviously, as part of the prep work, I shouldn't say obviously, as part of the prep work for the upcoming priority setting session in the spring of of 21, we'll do a complete report out. We'll do another one of these updates. 
most likely we will also provide an update on other initiatives underway as, as we're all aware there are a number of other issue, uh, initiatives that are occurring some of which i spoke to earlier and that'll be provided as background information and then we'd be looking for council to select its top three to five priorities for those two years recognizing work doesn't necessarily stop on these um, you know some of these i think would naturally carry over possibly as uh, priorities again Others may not show up as priorities, but work would still continue on those. And so that'll that'll be part of the process. I'm hoping, um, jumping ahead here quite a bit, but I'm hoping and tentatively planning to use a similar process to what we did two years ago for priority setting. I know it uh, was well received by council, that particular process. So I'm hoping to, to do something similar again. But really, ultimately, what it will come down to is resource allocation in terms of you know how many of these we were to carry on and then if there were hypothetically let's say they were all new priorities but council wanted these to continue as well that's something then we'd have to look at as part of the budget process and so that again was another reason why we realigned the timing of priority of the budget to better align with priority setting so what we'll likely do a little bit of a check-in and the egg is for the march priority setting session We'll give our best estimate at that point of what we think the budget looks like. We'll receive, in theory, a clear direction from the council on priorities for the, the upcoming two years. And then we will try to accommodate in the budget as best we can. And that would ultimately be vetted through the budget hearing process with your council. So in terms of the ones that would logically or naturally carry on, I, I view the climate action plan as falling in that category. It's already launched. It will continue on its forward momentum and progression. Is that how staff views it as well? Yeah, I mean, unless there were very specific direction from council to cancel that project, we intend to continue it um, to, to completion, obviously. Yeah. Um, so to, like, maybe it's more of the economic development and the your parks, your future phase two, and, and that's a discussion we'll get to by March, I guess. And. Uh, and where we go from there. there. I had a technical question about something that was in the staff report, the tables and chairs permit process. I wasn't familiar with what that referred to. Terry's gonna take that one. Sure, Terry Kilgore, Assistant City Manager. Um, so tables and chairs is the permitting process by which we allowed um, businesses pre-COVID um, to put out tables and chairs. Um, you, you used to see them out on the sidewalks um, up against adjacent to businesses. Um, what we learned through the rebound program is that there is um, interest in really looking at that program in more depth as well as considering options for perhaps expanding outdoor dining options beyond just the tables and chairs. Um, so there are many many options we could consider. There's some policy implications of continuing to use our parking spaces like we are now um, versus making things permanent. So we'll be coming back to the council for a study session on evaluating which elements of rebound we might want to make permanent. And we would propose rolling the tables and chairs discussion in with that larger outdoor dining piece of, of that dialogue. So that'll be um, right now tentatively scheduled for early February. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? I got bounced out. So if this is a repeat question, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow. Um, now I forgot the question. Um, oh, uh, Kristen. Um, Kristen, um, have, have we looked at how we're going to try and come up with any ways to project our budgets differently? Um, are we going to continue the same methodology or are we going to, um, yeah, how, do, how do we adapt to the, the new rules of not knowing what tomorrow looks like? That's an excellent question. Um, we are still going to be using the financial forecast um, model that we have, but again, we're gonna look a lot to the experts and Avenue is one of them that helps us project our sales tax revenues. So we're gonna be looking to outside um, economic forecasts to help us with that, but there will still be a lot of unknowns for a while, but 
um, and we'll do the best that we can to incorporate what we're seeing and what we're seeing in the economy into our, our forecasting. Thank you. If I could, Mayor, just to add to that briefly, um, you know, certainly forecasting is going to be more challenging. And if we come up with a methodology, we'll patent it quickly on behalf of uh, <laughs> one of the we can get some royalties coming in. But beyond that, I think really the key is to track the budget more closely. And just to give you a couple examples, when COVID hit and we didn't know what was happening, uh, Kirsten and her team were providing me as, with weekly updates for a while and what our revenue situation was looking like and our expenditures. Uh, we've eased off that a little bit, but bottom line is being tracked much more closely. As we noted earlier, we are planning to do quarterly updates um, to your council or at a minimum uh, departments will be providing them to me as opposed to that was biannually. So I think, you know, we're going to do what we can to refine the, the revenue projection process, but I think the, the stronger safeguard is we'll be tracking the budget more closely than what's been done in the past so that we can make adjustments as needed in a more timely fashion. Thank you. Any other questions before I open this to public comment? Seeing none, I now open the public comment. Does anybody wish to speak on this matter? We do have um, some, some individuals wanting to comment. We'll go ahead and bring in Carol Weed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weed, I'm concerned that you still have your mute on. Thank you. Okay, we're unmuting it twice. I'll, you can hear me now though, yes? We can, yes. Okay, so my question is with the uh, financial um, planning, where and when would consideration of um, divestment from fossil fuels in the city's funds uh, happen. Um, it's something that the council had talked about at the end of 2019 briefly. And it's at that time, pre-COVID, there was about 20% of the city's funds were in institutions, financial institutions that um, finance um, fossil fuel infrastructure. Many other cities have combined um, divestment planning with um, socially responsible investing and have a variety of ways that they've been able to this seemingly fairly simple accomplish that. So I would imagine there's less funds anywhere right now and in, including in so-called savings, but at some point, will this be addressed? Good question. Um, I, is there any other public speaker? I do not see any additional hands raised. Okay, thank you. Um, I will take the question under advisement. Um, any, I'm now closing public comment and bringing it back to council. Uh, do we have any further, do we have any comments? And if we do, would we please share them now? Council member Silva. Um, first, thank you very much to staff for keeping things on track in the most difficult time imaginable. And um, that's across the board in all departments because I think the, our council priorities really do affect all of our departments. I'll start with the fiscal sustainability. Um, we are going to have a lot still to do, but I appreciate that we have laid the groundwork in our um, long-term forecasting tool for, to, for us to be able to plan for the future and that we have good advisors. And I agree that we're going to need to be more cognizant quarterly of what's happened because we um, need to be able to adjust quickly. In terms of the um, economic development, I'm not sure that that's, see, I would, Matt, I would say, I have a feeling that is going to be front and center for us still because our economic development strategic plan has gone 
into a rebound mode and what does that mean as we go forward and I would um, so I'm really thankful to staff for responding the way they did with the rebound program for everything that um, the rebound program is teaching us and then also um, how the blueprint for success will help us probably be nimble enough to be able to respond to these housing demands that we're going to have in our housing element and finally, I will say, as we look at what retail means, we're going to have to figure out what it really means in terms of West downtown and North downtown specific plans versus downtown. How do we save downtown first and foremost? And then how do we redefine retail or ground floor spaces in housing and office facilities? So I think we're going to have to do some, once we're done with rebounding, some rethinking about what um, our economic strategies are. And I'm glad the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan have been moving forward and look forward to um, finding out what some of our best opportunities are. And um, at some point, we will be able to get started again on your parks, your future. I wish my desk was wood, but I knocked on it anyway. <laughs> so thank you. Anyone else have comments? Uh, uh, Council Member Francois, you moved on my screen when I got bounced out. My, my hand disappeared. Thank you. I, um, I'm concerned, I think, as we all are, with the number of vacancies in the, in the retail sector, especially on Main Street. Uh, it's concerning. And uh, so I, I think that there's going to have to be a concerted effort. I'm, I'm glad that we're being forward thinking in terms of hiring a consultant to help us with retention and attraction of retail. I think the economic development plan that we adopted two years ago was forward thinking in some regards there in terms of looking at Broadway Plaza and downtown as an experience based area that it was already shifting away from a sole focus on on retail and some of the projects that this council has approved like the foundry project dovetail, you know, a big food market downtown. I think once people want to come out again and it's safe to do that, those types of things I think are going to be quite popular. I would like us to, in a there's going to be a focus I know initially on retail, but then also I'd like us to have an office attraction strategy. And there's a lot of discussion, you know, there's an article every day, it seems like in the paper and the Wall Street Journal and the business journals about how office is shifting now. It used to be everybody wanted to be downtown in a big high rise and now no one wants anything to do with that. The, the suburban office park is back in vogue and I'm thinking, Shadelands. So it's, um, I mean, it's sort of like, and now we can't just react because it's right now. We have to see how this kind of shakes out a little bit, but kind of this hub and spoke idea and the suburban office park and ground scrapers I think there's going to be a shift, hopefully, finally, where employers don't just realize they have to be in Mountain View and Cupertino, but look at the Bay Area and look at the at LA and other parts around the state as more of a regional basis that they can have a system of, of offices ringing the area and people can just go to their local office and they can still have a dedicated office space that's not their home. Because I think people, I know I, I appreciate that and I think a lot of people still long for that in terms of productivity and being able to collaborate with people and work together, but they don't all have to be at the same place. So I, I'm excited about working, looking forward to that. I, I think it's critical that, and I know this will be a discussion for March of next year, that that we keep an eye on infrastructure because I think uh, you're, we still have a huge need there in terms of our pools and our and our fields and our parks. And I think we need to to really continue our investment there. So I, obviously all the efforts we've made on fiscal sustainability have, have served us well. And, we're, and we were able to close a $22 million gap between the two budget years um, with still tapping reserves, but not having to, to tap as deeply if we hadn't been prudent all along. So um, I wanna see our efforts on, this, on the climate action plan and sustainability plan continue forward, but I'm confident that they will, given that that's, there's forward momentum on that now. We've dedicated the funds for a consultant and to get it going. So thank you to staff. Um, 
these are challenging times, but they're all, there's also a lot of opportunities here to rethink and reimagine how we do things. Uh, I think this meeting that we're having tonight is illustrates that, and it's just one of many different ways I think we can operate more efficiently in the future across, across the economy and in the government and our all sectors of our economy. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thanks, and I'll, uh, I'll echo some of Matt's comments as well. I, uh, the, the fiscal sustainability, had we not been prudent along the way, we would have been in, in desperate shape. Uh, and as it was, we were, uh, we were able to at least work uh, with what we had to be able to get out from the calamity. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, but we're at least uh, a lot better off than most of the cities who didn't have that kind of fiscal responsibility up until now. And I think a lot of that certainly goes not just to this council, but to prior years as well and prior councils. So I thank everybody that was on prior councils and, uh, and before that too. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, we do need to keep our eye on that ball. Um, and that's going to be hard because we have less money to deal with, less budget and less reserves. So I think, uh, but we do, st we are still in the same exact situation that we were a year ago in terms of our, uh, our, our um, older infrastructure, including the pool. So that's something that we do need to pick up again. And glad to see climate action moving forward and, um, and the economic development certainly will continue to be, uh, as we talked about with the mobility, thinking mobility program, nimble. And I think that's gonna be the key when it comes to economic development is nimble. So I appreciate the work that staff has done uh, to date. This is evolving and this will continue to do so. And I look forward to doing this um, into the next year as well. Thanks. You're welcome. I can't find council member, so I guess. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to say change is never easy and change is what we've had all year. Um, we've had to adapt to so much. Um, it, it's, it's, I've, I've even almost forgotten what the old normal was. So, so um, that does get us to erase our, our um, must haves from the old times and substitute in things that might work better for the city. It is a really good opportunity to look at things new on so many levels. Um, and I am really proud of the staff and the way they've kind of embraced the concept. It's like they were looking at us as if to say, we're ready to change. And we had to have um, you know, this happen on us and um, encourage us to start thinking um, more freely and more creatively. And I appreciate the fact that you've, um, in many cases, taken the lead. Um, that being said, I am I appreciate all the work you've done, despite the fact we had to stop and um, do COVID. And um, it's actually a pretty impressive collection of accomplishments. Um, we have a, a request to accept the report. May I have a motion to do that? Uh, move, move to accept the report. Second. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Wilk. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Francois. Aye. Mayor Looks Hall. like Justin got bounced. He's um, right now. So. Yeah, um, I'm I as well. So it will pass. Regardless, oh, here he comes. Maybe he can make, if I tap dance a little bit more, he can make his, his vote. Hi. <laughs> there you go. Well done, bravo. All right, um, ordinarily we would be open to adjournment, but we have kind of an open issue to deal with. Um, before I, I have the authority to extend it, but I think it is appropriate more for me to request um, approval and acceptance by the council because I'm asking for more of your time to um, reopen the public comment. Um, so uh, does anybody have anything to say about whether we should or we shouldn't? And, and can I ask you for some more time this evening? Yep. Council Member Silva. 
Um, I was going to say, I think it's appropriate for you to reopen public communication. Um, I would hope that you would reiterate what the rules of public communication are, which really entail that we will not be having a discussion with the audience or discussing what they um, report to us. It is public communication on items not on the agenda this evening. That's right. I will get the actual language to do that if I haven't lost it in the pile of papers. Oh, I found it. Oh, I haven't found it, but you've said it very well. This is, um, we are, I'm assuming everybody has agreed. Um, uh, we are reopening uh, public comment. This is this portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the council cannot act on items raised during public communications. Um, but I'm so sorry, I have them all numbered and everything. Um, may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. Uh, request clarification or refer the item to staff. Is there anybody out there who wishes to take advantage of this additional amount of public comment? Madam Mayor, if I may, the council may want to ask everyone who's intending to speak to raise their hands now so that you can get a clear indication of how many people are going to speak. Thank you very much. Um, yes, at this moment, uh, if you intend to request public comment, uh, stick your hand up, the blue hand, or Star nine if you're on, although I don't see anybody on the phone. Um, and um, I'm going to count to 15. Slowly, you will watch me do it on my fingers. That will mean that at um, the end of the count, I will um, close the line for people who are um, going to make public comment. I'm up to 10. I'm close to 15. I see three people and uh, that is the number that we will accept for the additional public comment. Uh, thank you and uh, please, uh, City Clerk, will you bring them forward? We have Karen Perkins first. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted now. You are now. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Um, yeah, I was one of the ones who raised my hand right at the time. I guess you said public comments are closed. I think, you know, you should take as an example, um, Candace Anderson at the Board of Supervisors meetings. She actually calls uh, many, many times for public comments. She doesn't close it quite as quickly as you do. In fact, they actually had a 12 hour council meeting when there was a lot of concern on, by the public on, on systemic racism. And I know we had an eight hour meeting with this, but you don't do that too often. It would not hurt you to be a little more accepting, even if you closed public comments and three or four people came on to, to open it up. I would think that's really why you're there is to represent your constituents and to accept public comments. So that's one thing, and it is a matter of transparency. But then, you know, I did have, have comment about the, um, the Planned Parenthood protest. I think it's really important we don't start any kind of, um, you know, it, I think it's really important that there should be protection of protesters. And, and that basically that should be a priority for police if there is, if there even um, is a, a possibility that some kind of um, possible violence might start. And, and then um, there was one other issue I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, those, well, well, the whole um, mental health crisis unit, that was the other one, should be a non-police, obviously, mental health crisis unit. And, and that's something that's very important. And obviously, you've seen it by all the comments you have which really are not, you know, just the quote, silent majority. It's, it's everybody who who's cares about justice. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay, next we have Lucas Carboni. Thank you. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, Lucas. All right. Thank you. Um, and thanks for uh, opening this additional public, public comments period. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, three things today. Um, the first was the uh, incident on uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, I would like to uh, thank Council Member Wilk um, for bringing up the issue of the buffer zones, which is something that um, I have been talking about uh, quite a bit. Um, as I, I believe have, I believe other members of the community um, in reaction to this incident. I think that this is um, an important item that would uh, um, both allow for all protesters to um, exercise their First Amendment rights and to allow users um, of the clinic to access the clinic's facilities safely. Um, I think it would also serve to cool tensions between protesters and counter protesters. Uh, secondly, I would like to state my support for FOSAF's uh, demands. Um, I do believe that um, all that um, any response to um, FOSAF's concerns regarding the statements um, are advised. I think we, we need to, as a community, heal. And I think that um, the city needs to adopt an according attitude. And I think it's begun that um, perhaps to an extent with, I think, some of Captain Hill's statements tonight, but needs to move forward on that and it, with um, additional concrete policy actions. Um, thirdly, I would like to talk about the um, Rena numbers and some of the other development um, discussions that were occurring tonight. Um, I, you know, these numbers, um, I think they're overwhelmingly likely to be approved. We're probably going to see a 19% increase, which is um, in housing development, which is very um, similar to SB 50. I think that um, some actions that we could take would be eliminating uh, parking requirements within half a mile of transit. Um, I think we could also exercise, um, use AB 2345, the density bonus to allow to legalize three-story apartment buildings in areas which uh, are currently zoned, zoned. And last we have Melissa. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you for opening up public comment. I do wish, as Karen mentioned earlier, you would have um, reopened it knowing that people had just raised their hands earlier um, as I'm not paid to be here and it has been a long evening as I'm sure you all are aware of. Okay, 13 seconds in. So I got a more, minute and 45 to tell you what I experienced on Tuesday. Um, I awoke and was hanging out at home, decided I had a minute, wanted to check my Instagram. I noticed an individual that I follow named Trevor, who happens to be a photojournalist in the Walnut Creek area, had gone live. Um, I had seen him gone live previously at the Planned, Her Planned Parenthood facility, and I have to say that I have not witnessed him doing anything violent at any point. Um, when I happened to log on, it was literally just after he had gotten sprayed. Um, and there was dialogue going on in the live chat. I asked what had happened and somebody said tear gas. Uh, I happen to have aid for that. Um, <clears throat> as an ex Cal firefighter, seasonal firefighter and EMT, my response kicked in and, um, I grabbed what I needed and I'm, a, I'm very, close at that time. And so I, I was able to get to him probably within three minutes, certainly before um, 911 showed up. Uh, I rendered aid to him as soon as I could. And directly following, I contacted 911. I called. I had been told that Planned Parenthood had already called, but I didn't hear any sirens or anything. And, um, and he was, clear, you know, I mean, I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know if it was tear gas. I didn't know if it was pepper spray. I just knew it was some kind of chemical warfare that had been weaponized by a security guard. It was very apparent that that had occurred. Um, and yeah, the, my interaction on 911 did not We we have announced that we were doing two minutes. I apologize. I know that there are people. We, I announced that we were closed um, in plenty of time and people are still raising their hands. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to do.
I really don't. Um, other than to say that um, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>